now be recorded. I'm like 10 seconds early. Sorry. Let me know. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the regularly scheduled April 15th City Council meeting. If you could all join us and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. appreciate that. Uh, next up is the uh, roll call, please. Mayor Bellinger. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hagen. Here. Council Member Ingle. Here. Council Member Walker. Here. Council Member Stroman. Here. Thank you. Uh, before we get started, just to let everybody know, we are removing the closed session from our agenda tonight. If anybody was interested in that information, it is now being taken off for a later date. Uh, first up, yep, please. So before the presentations, apologize, I just want to introduce a new face in the room. Celinda Bigner here is, uh, has joined the city today as her first day as the finance director and HR administrator. So you will see her into the future and we are very glad to have her on board. Welcome. Welcome. All right, first up our presentations are our certificates of recognition. We've got Escalon Strong. Hogan Manufacturing and Escalon Small Animal Clinic. Let me grab these and I'll get to the podium and pull you guys out. <clears throat> you have someone here from Hogan Manufacturing by chance. Just really wanted to say we appreciate your uh, generous donation for the new home run fencing installed out there at Hogan as far as it's great. It looks great out there. Yeah. Uh, city Council and the City Escalon really appreciate your support and continuing support of our uh, youth sports here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, I would like to thank Councilman Hagen because if it wasn't for him, he uh, none of that would happen. So <laughs> I'm just the one that helped out a little bit, but he's the one that led the charge. So appreciate it. We have uh, the Escalon Strong organization. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> yes, your, your participation in definitely getting the uh, batting cages installed out at Hogan and Esfield. They look great. Um, I, I'm looking forward to the use from all the youth out there. And thank you very much for supporting our youth here in Escalon. It's greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. And our next one is for Escalon Small Animal Clinic for their donation of the new home run fencing as well, along with our folks there at Hogan, at the Hogan Ennis Park. City Council and Escalon uh, City definitely appreciates this for the youth sports. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. If anybody hasn't been out to Hogan Annis to see those uh, additions to the fields, they should definitely go out. Ball games start again with uh, rain, hopefully not this next weekend so we can play. Next Saturday morning, come out and check it out. They're pretty cool. Next up is going to be a couple of presentations, South San Joaquin Irrigation District Service Water Project Update as well as our Wastewater Treatment Upgrade uh, Project Update. Just let everybody know this is not a workshop but a presentation, so as in other items on our calendar. There'll be the presentation, we'll ask some questions, then like other items, we'll open it up to the public for questions and comments at that point. So with that, let's go ahead and start with SSGID, please. So real quick, Bradley, before we, we bring Bradley up, um, did want to share with the council, this is our you know, sort of continued but uh, renewed effort to bring um, updates of important projects, high profile projects before the council, before the community. Um, so we do have, um, our engineering staff, Ardura, Bradley here to provide a project update um, on the SSJID surface water project, our proposed project. Um, what we want to do in this presentation is kind of reset the conversation a little bit, um, start with 
you know, kind of some of the background, how we got to even thinking about a surface water project, and then we will get into um, what the next steps are for um, council's consideration in the community. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bradley. Thank you, Jalen. Good evening, thanks for having us. This presentation was structured based on previous meetings that we've had here and the questions that maybe went a little unanswered in previous sessions that I, would, I said I would find out answers and I would come back to you. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and, and cover sort of big picture how we got here and then specifics about the water quality and water quantity that we have and then finally um, some specifics about the financing of the project. So with that, if you all remember, this is the overview of the project. Right? It's taking surface water that is at the lake um, and tapping into the transmission line that goes down Dodds Road. Flow control facility at the north end that allows SSGID to control the amount of water that's coming downstream. And then it's in an 18 inch pipe all the way down Escalon below to, to the city limit. At the city limit, there's a pump station storage facility and it ties into the rest of the water system for the city. That's the overview of the project and, and that's what we're gonna be talking about. And if you guys will remember, the last time I was here, I presented to you details and, and items that came out of the 30% review of the project. So to backtrack a little bit, sort of how did we get here? In 2014, there was this thing called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And it's specifically AB 1739, SB 1168, and SB 1319 that all have provisions in there about how to maintain the groundwater and have a sustainable water supply for a lot of different things through, through uh, the next 20 or 30 or 40 years. And those things include agriculture, they include domestic water, they include firefighting water, they include all of the water needs within the region. It protects, this, this act protects the groundwater resources. It also sets priorities for different basins. So if you look at the way the state is constructed, there are a series of basins underground that hold on to water. They are divvied up into uh, physical boundaries of where that water it kind of commingles itself because of the geography and, and what have you, and, and geology. So this, this act sort of separates the state, and then in there, there's additional things that happen. So the sustainability plan gets created, and it's the, the, the idea is a sustainability plan is to avoid all of these undesirable things that would happen, and they, and they want to be able to do it in the next 20 years. That's the overview. Unfortunately, when you have something like this, you start to layer in requirements and regulations, none of which are cheap, and none of which are simple. So that's, that's sort of the basis of where we were. If you look at the timeline, I think this is really important. 2014, you get the Sustainable Groundwater Act. In 2017, the Eastern San Joaquin Authority was created. And then in 2019, the groundwater sustainability plan was enacted. It, it was adopted. We, from this point, from 2019 on, we had projects within the region that were in a plan that had been approved. So on the hook to deliver as a region these projects that are within the plan. And then the plan was updated in 2022. It will be uh, uh, reviewed again in 2025. And every five years subsequent, we'll have a review to figure out where we are in delivering these projects so that we get the sustainability of the entire basin. And 2040 is the goal to have these substantially completed and have the sustainability of the, of the groundwater uh, within the basin. So this is a picture of what the basin looks like. Here are all your neighbors, lots of them. If you notice that this, this sort of pink shape, it's governed by the Eastern San Joaquin Groundwater Authority, and it is considered a high priority basin. It's also considered critically overdrafted. Okay? Overdrafted simply means that they're pulling out more water than we can sustain, and we're starting to, to reduce the, the quality, and we're starting to reduce the, the quantity of water in the basin. It serves half a million residents, this entire region that we participate in. 
uh, was a projected growth rate, and that's one of the reasons why these projects are uh, set up the way they are and, and the timing of them. We end up with 415 public supply wells and 13,000 total wells. A lot of straws sitting in the water that everyone's trying to drink, and 35% of the total water supply in this basin comes from wells. Kind of overview. Now remember, I'll go back. This, this pink is managed by the, e the uh, Eastern San Joaquin Groundwater Authority. If you look at this Eastern San, San Joaquin Groundwater Authority, there are 16 sustainability agencies inside there. Local government, right? as close to local as you can get. And what I did here is I highlighted the agency that we're part of, it's at the bottom, and it's the South San Joaquin Agency. And our partners are Ripon and SSJID. So the three of us are in this subsection, and we are responsible for the local projects that deliver with the regional plan. Okay. If you look at what that group looks like for the South San Joaquin group, here's the geography of it. You can see where we are, you can see where the lake is, and the other people who are involved. This is the plan I was telling you about. So this plan was originally adopted in 2019, updated in 2022. It has projects that the region has committed to. Those projects include the wastewater reuse and the connection to the water treatment plant, which is the SSJID project that we're talking about. In Ripon, they also have a surface water project. And, and it's, I think it's important to know that uh, when Dominique was here, she was working with the city of Ripon to try to figure out how we can, might be able to do some of this together. So it's been on her radar working with adjacent uh, jurisdictions from jump. And then SSGID has commitments as well, not to just deliver service water, surface water to these jurisdictions, but also to pressurize their facilities and to start to reuse the stormwater that we're getting um, on the surface and, and be able to collect that and, and reuse it. There's some interagency coordination in the plan as well. It's not that important for this presentation. I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of it. So let's talk a little bit about water quality as we've talked a little bit about that in the past. Here's what we know. Over time, every six years in fact, the water quality standards are reevaluated. And every six years, generally speaking, we either see new rules for constituents that, that have to be dealt with, or that we're starting to see the maximum allowables come down over time. So it's harder over time to meet the water quality standards. And because we're losing water in the basin, we will generally see the quality of the water um, start to degrade or, or the, the constituents in the water move, move in the opposite direction. So they sort of converge over time. And in our wells that are here at the city, we have measurable amounts of arsenic, chromium, nitrate and nitrite, nitrate by itself, and TDS. TDS is total dissolved solids. So all of those are still within allowable limits. I want to be clear. They're still all within allowable limits. Arsenic is flat. All the rest tend to trend up. And they're, they, it just depends on the season that we have samples in and, and kind of what else is happening in the, in the water system. I have some other data if you want to see it uh, later, I can, I can produce it for you. And where this really come, becomes an issue too is that in smaller communities, you have a lack of redundancy in the wells that are currently there, no other water supplies. And uh, now all of a sudden you're having to, to, to sort of figure out what to do if a well goes down or if, if you have a problem with the water quality or water quantity in, in one of the wells. So, um, it, it, and it has a, a much more adverse impact on smaller communities than larger communities just because the larger communities have more sources of water. So let's talk about water quantity, like how much is there? How's this gonna work? So there are a whole bunch of monitoring wells within this basin and one of these, I, I have three different <coughs> pictures here. The first one you can see is just to the northwest of Escalon. And over time, you can see the trend of water in the, in the aquifer. These are, this is the amount of water that's available, right? So th this shows uh, just a trend that goes in the wrong direction. It's, we're, we're starting to, to get deeper and deeper uh, to, uh, to reach the water. And then this one 
if you notice, it's sort of due east of Escalon on uh, Valley Homes Road. And it's going down as well. On this graph and the next graph, you'll see two horizontal lines. The green line is the line which we're trying to stay above. However, you know, if we can stay above that, we're, we're going to be sustainable. If you get all the way to the red line, all of a sudden, it's sort of mayday. Things are a real problem. So what they've done is they've sort of banded this to say, hey, look, we need to really pay attention as it crosses the green line, and please, let's never get to the red line. So this is what we see over time, just, just east of town. And then this one is um, just northeast of town, and uh, it has... It has more data over a period of time. However, there's a big gap in the data. That's why it's, so, it's really flat. So rather than you know, trying to compare it, say, hey, look, nothing really happened in there. We don't know what happened in there. We just don't have the data for it. But in general, it's trending down. This is a graph of the actual wells in the city. So this is what's happening right now. and has been happening in the last 10 years. You'll see that there's a minor uptick from last year, and that minor uptick is from an unusually wet winter. Will that be sustainable? We have no idea. Will we have a similar effect because it's been a pretty wet winter this year? It's hard to really tell. Don't know yet, we don't have the data, but this is the trend. It's all going in the wrong direction. So as we talk about project costs and financing, one of those questions before was, well, how do, how do we finance this thing? How, do, how does this work? If you, if you go back and you look at what we've produced before and some additional information that has, that has come out um, at, between the last time I was here and this time, you'll see that the construction is still the 13.7 million that we thought before. Property acquisition, we're taking a guess at $50,000 and this is for the flow control facility that's at the north. You can see it on, on this chart here. Um, and then connection fees, SSJID is, is needs connection fees for a series of things. They have to change the way they operate. They have to put in the telemetry. They have to be able to communicate with the, the pump stations and, and everything else that's going on. And, um, and they have given us a tabulation of $1.1 million for those connection fees. So it brings the total budget of the project to about, six, or about $15.5 million. This $15.5 million includes a 20% contingency in the construction costs. And it's based on the 30% plans that we put together. And it's also based on 2024 dollars. So the longer that, that it takes to get it constructed, there, there is a chance that the escalation will, will uh, impact this project. So when we were looking at it, we understand that council it, it has, has been asking, how do, how do we fund this thing? How do we get it taken care of? And how do we do it and not have to impact ratepayers nearly as much? Well. The easiest way to finance this or, or get this thing built is through loan programs. There are loan programs available. The timeline for those loan programs is they're evergreen. They just come in and, out and apply and you'd be able to get a, a, a low, lower interest rate. Um, and there's two state, re the state revolving funds include drinking water revolving funds and infrastructure revolving funds. So with those, you, um, you apply and as long as you qualify, you can, you can work through that. There is a clean water state revolving fund that has a low probability only because the amount of funds available are really starting to be depleted. So I put a low probability there. On the grant side of things, we did some brainstorming over the last few weeks and some of those things that have uh, come up, a medium probability of getting our Prop 68 funds, which um, are part of the uh, East San Joaquin Groundwater Authority. They're already pursuing those through the DWR. And if they're successful with those, then they can distribute those into the plans that they help manage. The community project funding, uh, which Ripon received through Representative Josh Harder, uh, we see that as another opportunity. However, uh, it's, par it's part of an appropriations program, so it's hard to tell exactly what will happen. Um, then the, on the low probability, wind and water smart, certainly low, just because they're, they're $700 million uh, overcommitted just a lot, like a lot of other infrastructure projects or uh, programs. And then uh, we have heard before that SSJID would 
continue to support us, help us get through a process of applying for a small community sustainability groundwater management program or a grant. The challenge there is that we haven't seen a call for those projects since the December of 2022. We don't know whether or not there's going to be another one. So if there is going to be another one, SSJAD has told us that they would help us apply for one. So here we are with a timeline and some action items. We, we, we're bringing this to council so that we get a chance to, to get some feedback from you, make sure that everyone is still on the same page about continuing forward. There needs to be an update to the water master plan in order to understand the impact to the rate payers and try to figure out what that really looks like. Then securing some funding so that everyone is comfortable that this, this project can move forward, that once it gets designed, it can be built. We had heard very clearly from you that you wanted to go and visit the water treatment facility and try to understand it some more. They're willing to have you out there. We're willing to help you coordinate that and get you out there. And then uh, the property acquisition at the flow control facility, I think needs to be uh, taken care of before we start doing much more in the design, just because we don't know exactly where that's gonna be. And I would hate for any time or, or money to be wasted on things that have to be changed. So, um, once all that's taken care of, the first priorities are to get some geotechnical engineering done, understand exactly what the crossings look like, understanding uh, what, what the bedding material might be and, and what some of the construction details would be, potholing of existing utilities to make sure that we're missing all of those, and then finally the final design, permitting through uh, the, uh, the Department of Drinking Water and, uh, and CEQA to finalize. With a hope to get to construction by 2026, it was originally on the schedule to be in construction by 2024. So we're, that's what's in the, uh, the plan that was committed to in 2019. Uh, but uh, we, you know, that's where we're at right now. Thank you. You had a question? Oh, yeah. I had a couple of questions. Um, do we know what the percentage split would be potentially between RIPA and Escalon and SSJID? So each of those jurisdictions have their own projects in the plan. So on this particular pipeline, this particular pipeline is Escalon's pipeline. It's okay, so you're saying 15 million for Escalon? Yep. Okay. Yeah, there, there have been water rights that have been sold off and there might be some cost sharing with, with Ripon if we could figure out how to, to make sure that it continues to satisfy, satisfy some of their goals. But no one has an answer for what that looks like. Okay. Um, let's see here. And as, uh, as far as the rate payers are concerned, right, I thought they had already, we're already hitting that threshold, right? It's already been put in place, in other words, prior, or is this a completely different water rate that, uh, study you're talking about? This would be new. Okay. This project. <clears throat> that doesn't sound too good. Um, as, as far as the loan, you were talking about. Um, what's the story with that? You said that we can apply for a loan that's pretty much open-ended? Yeah, so Dominique had already started looking at the loan opportunities and the, the time frame to get a loan is open-ended. There's no call for projects and, and specific time that you have to apply and then sit around and wait. It's, it's a, an evergreen application process. And uh, so <coughs> as soon as we, as soon as somebody you know says that, that this is what they want to do, mm. then an application can go in. Is there like a set timeline to that as far as you know the um, the time frame you're paying off the loan? I do not know the term of the loan. I, okay. I don't. But because that's uh, important. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, if if we need to, um, we can go back and and look at the the two revolving funds and try to give you the details on what that low interest looks like, what the range might be as yeah. well as what the payment terms would be. Okay, thank you. Yeah, for sure. And are, just, are we, oh, please. I, I'll just mention that we do have SSJID staff in attendance if you have questions for them as well. Um, on the um, funding, financing, right, want to make clear, council has a determination on this. Um, certainly there are broader things that um, the city must comply with. So just make note of that. Um, but what we want to do is try to find the most appropriate financing or funding source, um, basically anything that we can get our hands on. Um, so we are exploring multiple options and we want the council to be aware of all the options we're, we're looking at. 
Yeah, and, and maybe to add, th thanks, Jalen. Um, to add to that, we have an internal um, grants team that we we went with them weeks ago, and they gave us some really good ideas that we presented here, and then like just late on Friday, they said, hey, here's some other opportunities, and I didn't get a chance to put them into the presentation. They include uh, WIFIA, SRF, uh, potentially bonds, Prop 84, Prop 1, Title 16, and, M and MWD. So there are some other options that we just didn't get a chance to evaluate before this presentation. They sort of just in time, and uh, we're, ha we're happy to figure out how to share the information for those as well. I think I've asked this question before, but are, are we required to, to participate in this? The, the commitment, ha, yeah, the commitment has been made in the 2019 plan that you would participate in this. And are, are there consequences or penalties for not? You know, um, Brandon might actually know what the answer to that is. I'm not as close. Um, just so you're aware, Brent, Brandon is from SSGID, and his background is that he's been part of the sustainable groundwater plan from the beginning. So he has some really good history. Good evening. My name is Brandon Nakagawa, SSGID Water Resources Coordinator. About four years ago, I was before your council um, presenting the groundwater sustainability plan before its official adoption in 2020. Um, I believe that question did come up. Um, what's the consequence, right? If you don't, if Escalon doesn't sign up now, what are the consequences? What we were able to do is put that project in a future project. It's possible that it could happen. If it doesn't happen, Escalon will have to rely on groundwater uh, for its foreseeable future. And that does a couple things. It, it puts you solely within Sigma and the groundwater sustainability law. So you are part of the overdraft problem and that needs to be corrected. Um, it's not necessarily a penalty from your neighbors. It might be a penalty from the state or a higher court, right? Um, landowners have the right to the groundwater. Cities, it's questionable what rights they have to groundwater. So that, that mix of uncertainty needs to be factored in in your decision about to join and get surface water from the plant or possibly fight out a long drawn battle if we cannot reach sustainability through the groundwater sustainability plan. Um, it's a very complicated, very convoluted issue. Um, I do wanna offer that staff is willing, able to attend uh, more city council meetings, workshops to present more information so that you get a better picture of what really the consequences are, what the, what the plans are, what the alternatives are um, when it comes to your groundwater future. Well, I like what you said, you said alternatives. So um, before, I, before I touch on alternatives again, can, can somebody tell me how much money we've spent to date on this project since its inception in 2019? Anybody? I don't know. Estimation? But summing is design, just design and kind of The money was covered by grant money from uh, the ARP money. There was money that we put towards that project for the payment of this, correct? Yeah. I can't correctly? recall if we, I think we did have some ARPA funds. Yeah, ARPA funds we put in towards this project, yeah. yeah. That we have used for infrastructure projects. Do you recall, <coughs> yeah. Yeah, it wasn't general, it was from a fund. I'd be interested in hearing what these alternatives are. I don't know if this is the forum for that or if, if we need to come back and talk about that again, but it kind of feels like we're being pigeonholed into one option, but from what you said, there are potential other avenues. I'd, I'd definitely be interested in hearing what those are. But when I, when I say alternatives, what I meant was continue to pump groundwater, um, those uncertainties in the future could be additional treatment, uh, higher standards for, for groundwater quality, drinking water quality. So they could be additional treatment at the wellhead. Um, deeper wells could, could be a lot of other 
things going on with your groundwater uh, sustainability. Uh, your other option is to connect to the surface water plant, get very pristine, high quality water, and mix groundwater in a, what we call a conjunctive use scenario to use groundwater when you need it, but rely on surface water because it's there and it's readily available and will meet your, your drinking water needs for the foreseeable future. Those are the two alternatives that come to mind right away. There may be more. Uh, there may be other considerations like uncertainty into the future. Um, again, the, the water quality issue is one that is, is we're all guessing. Um, and I can anecdotally share with you, city of Stockton, very different kind of city, huge city, $225 million capital improvement to build a water treatment plant from the Delta. One of the biggest drivers was arsenic. The proposed rule for arsenic was two parts per billion. Right now it's 10. 10 parts per billion, 85% of the wells could stay in service. Two parts per billion, 90% of the wells, 85% of the wells out of service. So they, they, they felt like they were really pigeonholed into that one option to get surface water from the Delta and build the $225 million project. That was about 15 years ago. Um, it, it, it really is uh, maybe the last opportunity to get on surface water uh, for the foreseeable future. You know, things are getting more expensive. The costs are astronomical. I think inflation, we all see it. So this is a very heavy, heavy topic for this council and SGID wants to support you, bring you as much information as you need, as you can take to make your important decision. This may be for our Dura and for staff, but with the alternatives that he mentioned as far as uh, additional treatment or other things, I'd be curious how that pans out, this project versus the cost of, of the potential future treatment or upgrades that would be required to our existing system, especially when we'd be looking at a, a loan for $15 million, potentially less any grants, um, how that was amortized, right? What, what the schedule looked like, how much we ended up paying back over the 20, 30, 40 year loan or whatever it was. We end up costing us $30 million over the next 30 years. And then we're looking at $3 million in upgrades over the next 10 years. Or, you know, if, if we could put something together that showed some type of comparison, that, that'd be appreciated. Yeah, I think um, it's really hard to make any kind of educated decision when you don't know the, the details of the financial part of it. Um, I think <coughs> that has to be, I mean, there's needs and wants, right? So obviously it sounds awesome to have extra water. I don't think anyone would argue if you built it up for free that we wouldn't let you just bring it in, right? But um, there's reality to f uh, funding projects and I hate putting it on the, the backs of our, tax um, you know, our, our uh, taxpayers. Um, I, I definitely would wanna see, I guess, all the options and how that looks. You know, how, how do we fund something like this without potentially, you know, putting the screws to our people. Part of, part of some background information that I would like to see as well would be, um, I know we recently built a well. If you can give us a ballpark all-in price for that well, I know we did it as part of our last rate study. That's why the rates went up was to build that new well to go deeper on that. So I'd like to kind of get a rough idea of what a new well would cost if we had to throw another well in if we lost one. I know we've shut down wells in the city over the years, uh, some as much as 20 years ago for various reasons. Uh, if we can get an idea of how many wells we have had, how many are capped and not in use, how many do we need? I know we're building one now because the state requires a certain reserve amount of capacity. Um, so if we lost a well at this point because of quality, either we had to fix that quality issue or drill another well. So that kind of background information would be nice to see in some format to show we've had 10 wells and we've shut down six of them, we're down to four, or whatever the numbers may be, just to kind of give us a ballpark of what we're relying on. And like the age of the infrastructure of those wells, if it requires, we have one that's been great, but it hasn't been touched in 50 years and we know the X, Y, and Z on that's gonna go down, it's gonna cost us X number of money kind of thing. Not go deep dive, but just some rough concepts so we have a better understanding of what our current system looks like. Mr. Mayor, may I ask a question? Please. So, Thanks for the presentation. Um, this council asked for quarterly updates. 
I would like to know what Ardura has done in the last four months. On this project? On this project. We had our pencils down because we were concerned about moving forward on, on these items that are, have financial consequences that you maybe didn't have all the information for. Um, I would just like to remind the council and our constituents that when this presentation was first presented to council um, and authorization was given, the cost of the project was seven to nine million. Uh, the last time we heard from Ardura, the cost was around 12 million. And tonight we've heard it's 15.5 million. Um, yeah, there's a, I understand there's critical decisions that need to be made, but one of the commitments that Ardura made to this council was to really look at grants and figure out what we can do, work with SSJID, and it sounds like none of that has been done. Yeah, we have options now, but the rubber needs to meet the road, especially if this council uh, has to make the decision, and it's a very difficult decision, but if the pencils are down and we're paying for work to be done, we expect there to be work to be done, especially when it comes to financing and options. So, and it's concerning that within four months, the project went up another three and a half million. And I mean, we're all dealing with escalation and inflation, but sure as heck isn't gonna go down. It's just gonna keep going up. So I would strongly request that as our representative, Ardura makes a really conscientious effort to work with the SSJID folks to really tr help us try to find grant opportunities. Because as Mayor Pro Tem mentioned, we can expect our ratepayers to help finance this project. I mean, they're already tapped out as it is. I, w I would also thank you for that. Appreciate that. I would also like to add a little bit of information. Brennan suggested that the, had, the proposed limit for arsenic had been two. It's 10 now. All of the wells that have testing data in the city of Escalon are at three. So if that becomes a reality, all of the wells that are current there are currently here won't meet the standard. And every six years, those standards are reevaluated. The new standards were expected to have been reintroduced <coughs> at the end of last calendar year. They're due any time. Just, it's just data. Well, to my other question, or I have one other question, and that is if this council or any future councils make the decision to move forward, how much design time do you believe you need to finish to get us into construction? The amount of design that's left, um, I, would, I would like to give you a, a very solid number. The challenge is negotiations for property acquisition and the uh, getting a, a permit from the Department of Drinking Water. Both of those are unknowns for us as far as how long that could take um, because of the different agencies and different people involved. The actual design effort can be done in less than six months to get us to the, to the end. Four months ago when, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, got a cough. Four or five months ago when you came and gave that other number, did that include the contingency fee amount in the prior number you gave us? It, Was, it included a contingency. It did not include uh, 2024 dollars. That's the, that's the fundamental difference. It was 2023 dollars. Okay. Say, say something. I, I guess where I'm stuck here is, um, you know, finding the funding. Um, so, I think the, the, the biggest push needs to be figuring out realistic, sustainable funding that isn't going to, you know, be a, a, an extreme burden to the people that live here. Yeah. You know, so I think the biggest, from a big picture standpoint, you know, if we could somehow figure out those details um, so that we can make an um, educated decision on something. Otherwise, we're talking about, you know, all kinds of things that we just, you can't pin down because you don't know what the price is. Right. And, and that, that's, that's why I put this schedule together the way it's structured and why I prefaced the 
the conversation. I think it's really important that the funding be, be discovered and everyone is comfortable that there will be money to deliver the project before anybody spends more time and energy trying to perfect the design or get to get to the end of a, a design cycle. That's my own personal So I'll, I'll just chime in here a little bit. Um, these are never fun conversations for staff. I mean, staff would prefer not to be having these conversations, not to be exploring this. What we want to share is not to pigeonhole or you know make it sound like there are no other options, but we want to express all the um, you know points here that make our decision or that will ultimately make your decision. Four months ago, there was questions about what is the groundwater situation? Is there really a need? Um, and so what we tried to do in this presentation was show you not only the water quality issues, but the water quantity issues. And we tried to share further some of the funding options. So we absolutely want to be able to give you, um, you know, right now, what it will cost and um, how we're gonna fund it. As these big projects work, these multi-million dollar projects, right, as you get closer, you identify funding sources that are more applicable. Right, the state and the federal government who are providing these funds, they're not on the front end, right, saying, okay, we'll give you funding for that. They're on the back end as you're closer, which puts the council in a hard situation, right? You're having to make North Star decisions. We want to head that direction. You know, we're trusting that this is in the best interest of the community and that we're going to find funding. But that's really, I think, kind of what we have to do here. Do we think that the surface water project will be in the best interest of the community in the long run, looking at the landscape of reduced um, MCLs, right? So water quality issues. If arsenic goes from 10 to two, what, are, what is our well situation gonna look like? What is, how is the state gonna ratchet up the use of groundwater if we continue and all other jurisdictions continue to pull water from um, the groundwater, right? Those are, those are what, those are the decisions we want to put in front of you as the decision, making, decision makers for this community. Um, so that's our, our goal here. We have no, I don't have any preference on which way we go. We just want to give the full landscape. I appreciate your input on that. I mean, I'm not sitting here saying that it's not in our best interest. What I'm looking at is I don't want to pursue a long-term goal and short-term, you know, bankrupt our city. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, we need to know, like, what the percentage on the loan is, what's the length of the loan, the terms on the loan, you know, what kinds of loans are available, uh, how much of it is, you know, funded by a grant versus the rest of it with a loan. You know, what, what does that look like on paper? Because, you know, we don't want to, you don't want to commit to something $15 million and then collapse our, our city, you know? So I think, I think we need to have like actual. A lot of that would come out of our rate study. If, you know, once we get to the point where we're ready to pull the trigger on something like that. But I so, think put, I'll put Bradley on the spot a little bit. The grants team, I mean, high level, do you think we can get some, information on some of the loans and grants just you know terms and absolutely percentages and yes okay so absolutely we can, we, we can but, get that and, and share that Jalen and Bradley this this is what this council needs we need a, a financing plan for this project and then we also need options as council member Engel and mayor pro tem mentioned so we need you to work with SSJID either options for this project or options outside of this project so that we can make the best decision that we can. Because right now, I understand the pencils are down, but I'm not comfortable making a decision because I don't, none of us have all the information that we need. So I would request for your next quarterly update, if you can come back with very specific financing options, as well as options for this project, either options for this project or options if we choose not to move forward with this project.
because those drive the decisions that we need to make. Understood. Any other questions here before we open it up to the public for any concerns and questions? Please. On the funding opportunities side, there is something coming up, um, one voice trip, if any of you are attending that. Um, SGID and um, Dominique worked on a support letter for Congressman Harder. Congressman Harder will be trying to put an earmark in um, for Escalon for, for your connection. Rippon received $3 million, I think, in the last appropriation. So this is a serious opportunity. I think if any of you are going to One Voice, I would strongly suggest you get in there with Congressman Harder and let him know how important this project is, how important the funding is to making it a reality. Uh, was, we have done the same. What was your name again, sir? My name is Brandon Nakagawa. Brandon, just for the record and for the public, last year when this funding opportunity came up, Dominique and I did have a conversation with Congressman Harder's office, and quite frankly, I felt like they sold us down the road. They, we, they said, you need to fill out this information, <laughs> Dominique jumped through many hoops working over the weekend to submit that. And Congressman Harder's office said, yeah, 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 we believe in Escalon. And then we turned around and they awarded it to our friends in the Southwest. Quite frankly, I took that as a slap in the face because our project is much further along than the city of Ripon. And so it just boils down to politics. I appreciate what you're saying. But unfortunately, Congressman Harder always seems to forget about his friends in Escalon. You. All right. Uh, at this point, we can uh, go ahead and open up to public uh, comment or questions at this point. Get the, well, go ahead and come to the podium if you could. Yeah, just like any other topic, come to the podium. <coughs> Get the five minutes and everything. I believe your last report to council was in February of 2023? December or January? December 23 or, or yeah, January 24? Okay. What, what percentage ago. of the project was completed at that point? 30%. And going back to February of 2023, how, how much of the project had been completed by that point? I recall 30%. This project hasn't moved forward based on what they're saying here in a year. We don't see any financials. You asked how much money's been spent up to this point. There's a contract with this company to provide this report every three months. Prior staff never held the wastewater treatment project uh, to that uh, requirement or, or the surface water. So the question of, that you brought up, how much have we spent up to this point? Unbelievable they can't answer that question. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, was brought up years ago with uh, Mr. Haskin, myself, um, Tammy, I believe one of the representatives from SHAID, we met over here uh, regarding this project. And I brought up, I said, how come SHAID can't help fund it? No, give us a 10-year, no-interest loan. You know, we could, we could work with that. We could pay that off. I think that ought to be looked at as part of this funding package, something along that line. This thing's been held off, not by this council, but by you know, the people you have working on it. It hasn't moved forward in a long time. I can't understand why the design isn't even done. That's unbelievable. I mean... 350 years is going to be 650 whatever thousand for the final design. How come it's not done? I'm just, I'm just curious. Um, I wanted to address some of the uh, issues. Over 20 years ago, this city council uh, put in one and a half million dollars for a placeholder to tie into this line with the prospect in about 10 years we would, we would connect uh, Escalon to it so we wouldn't have to dig any more wells. We have flexibility. When, when droughts come, there's uh, uh, cutbacks by the state. We can get cut back 20, 30, 40% uh, with our wells. With, with a surface water connection, even if that was cut back 20 or 30%, Escalon would be golden. 
we have enough flexibility where it really wouldn't affect us. It might affect Stockton or somebody, but not us. So that's, that's a, one of the major points that I see of having this surface water project completed as soon as possible. The, what's the name of that device that you put at the, uh, the beginning of the line? Is that yeah, I have a problem with that. You know, they're dictating to us that that flow control device has to be right there next to their pipeline. I, can it be engineered where it's over at the park? We've, we've presented options to SSJID. Then SSJID should pay for that flow, flow valve. We shouldn't have to pay some, some property owner to put it there when we could put it on our property. And if SSJID is saying, <laughs> You're going to do what we tell you. Let them pay for that. That's 50 grand. I, you know, you, you need some real pushback here on some of these things. Um, flexibility. Mr. Ringle brought up uh, this point. Good point. Uh, whatever the contaminants are in groundwater, surface water, what have you, there's always some kind of filtration treatment uh, that can be installed. That ought to be part of a presentation for flexibility on what if, and you know, what's the contingency of saying, we can't get this water coming in and we have to deal with some of these you know, problems that could be foreseeable, what would it cost to actually bring that out of the water before we ship it into our, our water pipes? So I, I, would, I would ask for that. And yep. uh, Sean and I have brought up many times on the list of demands where this money's going, you know, for Dura, Blackwater, and we've had very few presentations. When these presentations that we're, we're going to get now every three months uh, come out, there should be an actual budget shown on what they've spent the money on, where we're, where we're at, what's it costing us per day for not moving forward, that, that whole projection. Those are things, you know, this was a very generic presentation about groundwater sustainability. It's a lot deeper than that, and I don't know if it's going to put you to sleep, but uh, there's a lot to it. I think you, you're going to be attending the meetings now for, for Esquan going to SSJID. He could give you a report. Um, well, you can wrap your comments up here over the five. Okay. Sorry to take an extra five minutes, but this is near and dear to my heart, so I want to express it. Thank you. Council members, Mr. Mayor, uh, Kurt, everything you said is on the money. I wish you had more time to go on. I liked what you had to say. Uh, the most obvious thing to me, two things. One, I don't think there was enough transparency for you guys to have good decisions made because you didn't have the information you needed. That's number one. Number two, money is the bottom line here. And I don't think you've had enough information on how to get that, whether or not we could sustain that. Those are the two things I think we need to clean up. And uh, I'm not going to badmouth them for what they didn't do or did do, but you need more information. You didn't get it. And until you get it, I'd be very hot, careful about what you did because, like you said, you don't want to bankrupt our town. We need to know what the funds are going to be for water. We need to know what the total cost is going to be with the interest and whether or not it's sustainable for us. I mean, we may not have any water, but we may not have any money either. So I think you're doing a great, good questions, all of you. I think we're on the right track, but don't sign up until you get all that information. Kurt, good presentation. Anybody, excuse me, <clears throat> anybody else in the room who would like to come up on, on this topic? Anybody on the GoTo meeting tonight? No one's raising their hand. No hand raised. Okay. Well, at that point, thank you for the presentation. We're going to go ahead and move on to the wastewater treatment plant upgrade project update. Good evening, council members. My name is Allison Fruya. I'm with Blackwater Consulting. I'm here to provide you with a status update of the wastewater treatment plant upgrade project. Although the main purpose of this presentation is to update you on the status of the project, I have included several background slides to uh, refresh our memories um, and uh, review information about uh, the history of the treatment plant 
and events that led to this project, and then I'll end with information <coughs> on next steps. The wastewater treatment plant, it's located south of River Road, north of the Stanislaus River, just west of McHenry Road. It was first constructed in the 1960s. It has undergone multiple expansions over the years. Um, it is permitted by the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board. They are often referred to as the regional board. Um, they <coughs> provide waste discharge requirements, which are also referred to as permits. Uh, the current permit that the city's treatment plant operates under is was adopted in June of 2000. And it sets various prohibitions and limits, including flow limits, uh, just to note that um, the treatment plant is unique in that it's essentially two treatment plants in one. And the flow limit for the industrial storm incoming flows is 3.4 million gallons per day, or MGD, average daily flow over a 30-day period. Um, we don't really see those in recent years, the flows uh, reaching that point in recent years as far as average monthly flows go, but peak flows are over 3.4 MGD several times each year. On the domestic side, the permit has a limit of 0.9 MGD, average dry weather flow, and a peak flow of 1.0 MGD. Domestically, incoming flows are around 0 0.45, 0 0.5 MGD, so you're at about half capacity there. The treatment plant relies on an aerated pond type of system. This is a technology that has been around since the early 1900s. Um, it's pretty much been the same at the treatment plant uh, since the 1970s. And then on the disposal side, percolation ponds, which are essentially unlined ponds that allow the treated effluent to seep into the groundwater are used. In 2004, there were over 20 unconfirmed odor complaints received by the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control Board, and um, those complaints are a violation of the permit. That triggered a site visit by the regional board's compliance and monitoring section, and during that site visit, they observed that all of the percolation ponds were exceeding the freeboard limit listed in the permit, meaning that the water level in those ponds were clo was close to um, within one foot of the top of the ponds and when it should be over two feet. During that visit, they also observed that there was vegetation or weeds growing on the side of the ponds that encourages nuisance conditions and breeding of flies and mosquitoes, another violation. And then uh, shortly after that visit, there was a leak from one of the percolation ponds into the Stanislaus River, which is a major violation. And so this triggered not only the issuance of a notice of violation, sometimes referred to as an NOV, but also a cease and desist order, which is much more stringent. It's an order that's adopted by the regional board. <laughs> And it required the submission of several reports, all of which have been completed and submitted. And I want to note that this order did not specifically require an upgrade project be done. However, uh, it is oftentimes the case that agencies will implement improvements that trigger a new permit. And because the new permit needs to go in front of the board, as well as rescinding of a cease and desist order, oftentimes the compliance and monitoring section will wait until a new permit is being adopted before they rescind the order. So sometimes people ask, well, why has this been around so long or is this common? Well, this is one of the reasons why. In 2018, the city issued a request for proposals for a project to identify uh, solutions to expanding the plant to address the moratorium on annexations. Um, PACE was selected to complete that study and they completed that report in November of 2019. Not only did the report look at expansion of the facilities, but it addressed many of the issues that were identified in the CDO. It provided solutions, identified six alternatives which were presented to city council at a workshop and alternative 2B was the recommended or the selected uh, alternative to move forward with. Alternative 2B is a combined facility, meaning that you no longer have two separate treatment plants. It would combine the industrial storm flows as well as the domestic flows together and treat them in one set of treatment processes, which would be an extended aeration activated sledge type of treatment system. The 
Overall capacity would be 3.0 MGD, which is actually lower than what your existing permitted capacity was. I believe that limit was set because you haven't been seeing the peak flows that the industries had been permitted for, although their existing industrial discharge permits do allow for peak flows that match with the existing permit. It, um, this project plan for treatment uh, to recycle water standards of half of the total flow so that it could be recycled and sent to SSJD facilities. Um, and then it didn't include some important items such as upgrades to the percolation ponds, although those ponds would continue to be needed because you wouldn't be treating all the flow to recycle water standards, and it didn't include standby power. So the wastewater treatment plant upgrade project was to take this alternative 2B concept from concept to construction. Um, but I think there was an acknowledgement that further evaluation of alternative 2B was warranted to make sure that this was the way that the city wanted to move forward. And alternative 2B, uh, sometimes there's mention of a 16.3 million expansion project or $16 million expansion project. Well, that was the alternative 2B project. Um, there's over 20 tasks included in the upgrade project. I've boiled them down into three major categories with the validation of alternative 2B, then preparation of permit renewal documents, and then preparation of design documents and construction support. There was also a task um, to prepare a USDA funding application for the project as well. So when we started the project, we being Blackwater, we met with the city staff, we reviewed the concept for Alternative 2B, and we asked for input on any other issues of concern. Um, this slide summarizes some of the six major ones. The, the one that I really want to mention tonight is this identification that a feeling that there was insufficient funding at this time to long-term maintain the existing facilities. Because I think that's important to note since we're not just talking about money needed to upgrade the plant, but hearing from city staff indicates that money is needed to keep this plant operational. Right now they're jerry-reading equipment to keep things moving. There have been issues um, such as solids accumulation in especially the domestic ponds that isn't being addressed, um, but definitely needs to and will become an issue if it isn't addressed. When we began this project, we also looked to identifying what potential future permit requirements might be in the new permit. And we know, uh, looking at other projects, that the tendency is for effluent BOD and TSS limits to be reduced. Um, there has been a greater emphasis on effluent limits for nitrate and salt um, recently by the State Water Board. If the city wants to go to <coughs> recycled water, there are requirements for redundancy and reliability, as well as overall, um, the state has increasingly added measures for protection of groundwater and surface water. So to date, we have completed many of the reports that were part of the scope of work, um, the alternative 2B validation study, a preliminary design report, preparation of a preliminary engineering report for the USDA funding application. We've also prepared design documents and completed the permitting documents. The focus over the last six months has, to be, has been to really integrate the uh, participation of the regional board, and there's two sections that will be involved. There's the compliance and enforcement section. They're the section that will order an NOV or a CDO. They're the ones that look at the monitoring reports and um, make sure that the agency is complying with the permit. The other section is the waste discharge to land permitting unit. Sometimes I might refer to them as the permitting unit. They're the ones who are responsible for issuing new permits. And both of those sections um, are, will be involved in this project because we want to ensure that the CDO and NOV is complied with and that um, we, the upgrade project adequately addresses that unit's concerns. And then the project will include a new permit, and so the permitting department is involved. Meetings with industries have also occurred. There's been at least two meetings over the last six months. 
Um, my next few slides will review some of the discussion items for those meetings. And we are looking into funding options. So USDA was a part of the original contract um, to submit an application. We've also recommended pursuing CWSRF funds um, because they have the potential to offer grant funding for the city. So correspondence with the regional board. We had a meeting on October 24th. Uh, that meeting included both of the industries Escalon Premier Brand, Eckerts, it included city staff, myself, and both of the units from the regional board, the compliance and monitoring, and then the permitting unit. And several actions came out of that meeting, action items. Um, the first one being that the compliance and enforcement section, we really were trying to pin them down to say, have we satisfied all the requirements? What are the remaining issues for the plant? And their response was, I want to take a look at the NOV and all the reports that were submitted and the monitoring data. And they've been doing that. Um, most recently, they had a site visit to the Escalon treatment plant um, earlier this month. And we've been corresponding with them, checking in with them monthly to see when are we going to get this compliance re review. We haven't received it to date yet. The next step after that. Um, is when the waste discharge to land permitting unit will start to get involved, more involved because we've already submitted initial, um, it's a, a report of waste discharge, it's basically like a, a new permit application. We've submitted that to them. They are waiting to receive the input from the compliance and enforcement section. And they have said that this is uh, a very critical step in the process of creating a new permit because they don't want to take orders to the regional board that need to be amended in the near future. They want to make sure to get it right now. And so that's why the cooperation between these two sections is such a critical part and such a critical step in this project. So once we get the compliance review, the permitting unit will also take a look at the compliance review. They'll review the report of waste discharge. And together with the compliance section, they'll have comments um, and we'll work through uh, pre preparation of a new permit. Something that the permitting unit really has emphasized with us is that this is a long process. They say it takes at least a year and expect it to take longer in this case because it's needed to have the cooperation of the compliance and enforcement section. Meetings with industries, uh, the, one of the, a few of the main goals of those meetings have been to make sure that they're supportive of the upgrade project. They're a major discharger. They actually uh, contribute over 50% of the total flow and over 80% of the loading to the treatment plant. So they will be responsible for contributing their fair share of the project. And it's important to make sure that they're on board, they're aware of those costs, and that they are going to contribute those, uh, the payment for those costs um, because those costs should not be taken up by the rate payers. Uh, another discussion item with the industries has been the idea of them doing more pretreatment on their facilities rather than putting the burden of treatment on the city. It's a win-win situation for, uh, for both entities because if the cities do it, if the city does it, it will probably be more expensive. There's more regulations. There's prevailing wage you have to deal with. Um, but if the industries did it, they don't have to deal with those same labor rates and uh, same set of approvals and requirements. If they reduce their loading and flows, that means that there's less cost for the city upgrade project. And it also means that there's less rates that they have to regulate contribute because they're contributing less to the treatment plan. So next steps, um, this coordination with the regional board and industries, it's a critical step. Um, it's been over six months. We still need to continue that coordination to really get them to pin down and commit to uh, things that the rest of the project will depend on. We want that in writing and we want to make sure that commitment is there. Um, we will make adjustments to the design based on the direction from the regional board as well as the commitment from the industries. And then um, meanwhile, we'll be continuing to seek support um, from funding programs such as USDA and the CWSRF. And uh, we recommend that a rate study also be conducted. Uh, the last rate study was done in 2016. Sewer rates have remained the same since 2021. City staff have 
um, mentioned that the existing rates aren't really cutting it long term for long term sustainable management of the treatment facility. And so it's really important to get a handle on what the rates are going to look like, how we can manage what the rates will be, how we can get funding to keep the rates low um, and not impact the residents um, severely. So, any questions? Many, <laughs> many questions. Um, unlike our friends at Ardura, um, your presentation didn't include a cost of the project today. So last presentation last September was 40 million. What's the cost look like today? We haven't updated the cost. So we haven't applied any inflationary measures no. to it. Okay. Um, same question I asked Ardura. Um, what has happened in the last four months from Blackwater standpoint since the last presentation you gave? It's mainly been the discussions with the regional board and the industries. Okay. Just um, I want you, Allison, and you, Bradley, to understand this is not personal, but as a council member, it is very frustrating to see the amount of money that we are paying Blackwater and Ardura, and there's not a lot of stuff happening. We, if you want us as the governing board of the city of Escalon to make decisions, I ask that both of you and your teams give us information so that we can make a decision. Um, I appreciate this presentation by Blackwater, but um, I have the presentation from September 5th. It's almost a regurgitation of what was presented in September. But meanwhile, we are presented with bills to, to pay Blackwater and Ardura. And it seems like it's just stagnant. And our, uh, it's no fault of yours. We need to make a decision. I understand we need to make a decision, but we need you to give us the information we need to make a decision. So please don't think I'm attacking either one of you. I just, we need information. For this project, I don't think a decision needs to be made at this point. I think we're waiting for input from the regional board and from the industries um, to move the project along before the city has to make a decision. Well, here's my concern with that, and, and I appreciate the comment. My concern is that we have nothing in writing from the industries, nothing. And so there needs to come a time and a point where we have a firm commitment mm -hmm. from industry in writing. Yes. That's the driver. Second thing that we need is we need to include a percentage for escalation in there because if the state of California takes their wonderful time, there's gonna be escalation in that cost too. And so we need to make sure that they know that we have to build in, we may have to build in inflation to this number. But the important thing as to help represent our ratepayers is we need something in writing. I know you and, and Justin and Tom are working on that. We appreciate you guys working on that. but. We desperately need something in writing from them. Yes. Can I ask for some, um, for Public Works, for Justin? Um, how do you feel, what's, what's your gut feeling on things? Like, how do you feel this is going along? I mean, really, it's going along as smooth as it can. We definitely have the buy-in from the industries. Um, I would say the only negativity at all that we've gotten from industry is those are not the biggest fan of combining the treatment because they like having their, their treatment different. But that literally is the the only thing that we don't have buy-in. It's hard because we go with the conceptual idea that we have from Pace, we get a design, and we realize how big of a design that is. But without all the information we have from the state, we don't want to commit to that because there's changes that could be made for the better for both halves. So really, until we get exactly what we have from the state, all we can continue to do is discuss with Blackwater on how we can make this happen. Discuss with the industries on what they can do in the moment keep the plant running as well as it has been running in the last few years without any compliance issues. Mm. <clears throat> Thanks, I appreciate that. You're welcome. Well, that would be my question. What are we looking at annually for cost of maintenance for the system? 
annually now. Yeah, currently. I mean, I'd have to look into it, um, and I could definitely get you that number. It's uh, it it it, it kind of varies. It's honestly getting better in the last few years because we're able to sustain some of the stuff that we were doing. But again, it's with all old equipment. We're not really in the getting the new. It's just kind of band-aiding what we have at the moment. Would you think it's thousands, hundreds of thousands creeping into the millions? Just well, as especially estimate? if you add in the sledge removal, it would be hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands? I think it's close to a million. Is my um, How far out are we from getting an answer from this whole compliance issue? I think it's within a month. The site, so I had, the last contact I had with uh, the, the regulator was mid-March and he said he's almost done, he needs to have a supervisor review and then he must have scheduled the site visit for April 2nd. So it's moving, it's moving slowly. Um, so fair to say once this month-ish timeline, I'm not holding your feet to the fire, but that timeline, roughly short period relative to what we've been experiencing. After that, um, then we'll be able to pin down some sort of written agreement with the um, industries, you think? Yeah, that's definitely hope. And we have more of an idea of which way we have to go, which we can't give them that answer. It's hard to have them commit to a dollar amount when we don't have one to give them. Yeah, understandable. Um, they're, they're definitely in the process of working with us. They have nowhere else to discharge. They have no choice but to work with us. Gotcha. So, Justin, let me ask you a question on that. When Pace presented option 2B at the 16.3 million, there was a breakdown for between the city, Eckert, and um, Esclam Foods. Why can't we go to the industry using those same percent percentages that were presented under 2B and say, okay, now the project is 40 million. The city's portion is $10.8 million. Eckert, your portion, this is all worst case scenario. Eckert, your portion would be 6.4 million and Escalon Premier Foods, your, your portion would be 22.8 million. Why can't we do a worst case scenario and see, and if they say, oh no, 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 we can't commit to 22.8 million, then we can say, well, what can you commit to? And then we get that dollar amount and then that's what drives Blackwater to complete the design within some sort of budget. I think that that's kind of where we're working. We have pre prepared cost estimates with a breakdown for um, between industries and the city. And um, the discussions now, I think the initial reaction was like, that's crazy. <laughs> and um, so that's why there's this movement and discussion on, okay, well, what industries can you commit to as far as reducing your loading, because then we can revisit the project costs and see what that is. And it's you know it's this this sort of negotiation or. And, um, and just real quick on that, I think you know part of the the challenge there is they are making a hard decision, just like this community and this council is. They are going through the iterations just like we are. Okay, can we put up this amount that we have at the $40 million plant? Can we do things on the front end um, for our to reduce the cost, right? They are going through these iterations as well. If we ask them for a number now, of course they're gonna lowball it, right? And then we're, we're designing a plant based on their number that may or may not be compliant with the state. So we have you know, this three-legged stool here that we are trying to march forward with each party. We have heard the council, we are working with the industries to try to reduce the cost of this overall plant. It takes them some time to make those decisions. Um, I don't think the characterization that, you know, sort of nothing has been done in the last several months is, is accurate. These things take a very long time. Um, the state compliance process has taken a very long time. I think some of that is good news for us. I think it shows that we are making progress towards our NOV and towards this overall compliance letter. I think that's a good thing. We want for this project not to be $40 million. And so we have to go through the process. We have to show them what we're doing. We have to show them the strides that we have made. 
um, so that we can try to drive this down. And, you know, just like we don't want to make a decision without knowing all the details, the industry is in the same spot, but they are at the table with us. They are at the table with us. Um, no one's signing on the dotted line right now, right? Um, we're all walking together through this process. If I said, I'm sorry, real quick, if I gave the impression that nothing's been done, my apologies to you. My apologies to you, Jalen, and my apologies to you, Bradley. My point is, we're all living in very trying economic times and inflation numbers are absolutely horrible. I live and breathe in the construction world every day with inflation numbers. And I know that the state of California wants to take their wonderful time, but we as a city have to be proactive and come up with a solution to try to hedge off those escalation numbers as much as we can. That was my point. And I'd say to a large degree, that is what the city is doing. And we've come up with this idea relatively recently to see what the industry can do on the front end um, to reduce the overall cost of the project and make it less burdensome for all involved. Thank you. So I, uh, I'm a bit disappointed today with the update. Just, um, you know, I was, we were, well, we've been given a timeline, right? So uh, in September, we met, and I think my specific question was uh, where we would be and how long it would take for us to be ready for to have a plan for industry to take back to corporate to see what they could contribute. And I know that on our timeline, it says three months to go from a 90% plan to a 100% plan. It's been five months, and I and that the answer to my question was about April. So at about April, we should be able to have industry go back to corporate, see what they can bring to the table. And unfortunately, it looks like I mean we're working towards that. But it looks like we haven't been meeting in the bi. I, I was under the impression we were meeting with industries bi-monthly um, instead of twice in the last six months, I guess, um, or six it's, months ago. And it's six, been more than twice in six months, but we can get you that. Okay, thank you. Um, and so if we are working with industry and there is this alternative plan for them to be taking part of the load, I would hope that that plan is being constructed as well because now we're going to have to see and approve another plan that we haven't even, that now that 90% plan is not the plan anymore. And now we have to start from scratch is what it sounds like. You're going to have to create a plan where ours is not that to be that we're talking about and we're going to have to just create this entirely new plan with industry, and I love that it's gonna cost less. I love that they're buying into it, but it doesn't seem like we're moving at a pace. It, it just is like time is five months apart from step to step instead of month to month or you know every other month. Like we're supposed to be sitting down with industry and say, what does your plan look like today? Let's put it on paper, and I don't see that. And um, I would like to see that hard line. What have they gotten? Have they have they gone back to corporate? And corporate said, "Oh, that 40 million, we can't take that. Like we we can't do that 60 percent. We're supposed to be contributing. It's just not going to happen. But what can we do?" And I'd like to see what what is their proposal? Like what is the proposal that is going to be them giving you know taking some of that. Um, some of the burden off of us and what what is their idea and what is that uh, that they have in mind because that would be what our moving forward would have to be at this point so um, that's what I'm looking forward to it you know in the future and I hope that we can move at a better pace because uh, at this uh, inflationary rate it's just astronomical more and more and more so um, that's what I'm hoping to see is more of a hard line I mean, it, it just is in the clouds right now that maybe industry is going to take some of this burden. So I'd like to see it on hard paper if we can see that from industry or an idea from industry. So thank you for your presentation today. Question re oh. regarding those industries as well. Um, just like us, like everybody said, they're making those financial decisions. Is it worth the skin in the game to upgrade at all? Or do they honestly close shop and walk away from Escalon, depending on those numbers? So has anybody looked at the idea that they both say, you know, we have other plants, we can readjust and work in another community, we can upgrade their plant in another location in the state or another state, and they walk from us, what does that do to this plant upgrade? Are we required to do anything with our existing infrastructure other than to update the 50-year-old infrastructure we have? Does that change what we are required to do if an industry, one or two of them, or are they both, in some fashion, walk from us? 
Mm -hmm. So I haven't seen, heard anybody say, industry just said up and up, and we've done the analysis. Financially, it does not make sense. We're going to walk. Because plants can just, I mean, Tri-Valley, other locations all around the valley, they just up and shut down. And so if that happens two years after they commit, are we on the hook for their part that they didn't pay yet? Those are the concerns I've got is, okay, great, we got them to commit to the whatever X amount of millions of dollars they're going to pay. Two, three, five years down the line, we're still paying, and they decide that, you know, we can consolidate and run that out of the Merced plant. We don't need the Escalon plant. So somebody shuts down a plant. Where does that, where does that leave us hanging with the financial obligation that they have with us? Because just because you had judgment doesn't mean you get paid. And then it's on us to pay for that upgrade. So has anybody done any analysis in that regard if they walk? We haven't done an analysis, but that has been a discussion item that that needs to be in writing, an agreement with the industries that they are responsible for payment of the entire cost of their share of the upgrade project. That payment would be considered upfront? I think They can get their own loans of, and stuff, but they would write us a check before we started the project, I would hope, so that then we know we have our money and they can worry about the banks being paid back at that point. Yeah, that would be part of the discussion item with them. Um, quick question. How realistic do you think it is, if we're hearing back from them in roughly a month-ish, to have something written down, you know, that's uh, solid on paper, as far as an agreement? From the industries? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I know there's negotiation involved and, you know, that kind of thing, but, huh. I mean, is this something that we can have hammered out in a quarter, or are we talking like another year? Or, you know, what kind of timeline are we talking potentially? Like, say the compliance comes back, everything goes ideal, everything's good to go. Um, they're on board, it sounds like. We sit down with them, hammer something out. What's that look like to you? Like, roughly a quarter, like three months or so? I or? think it's more on the order of the year. The city staff have been taking the lead on the discussions with the industries. Um, there's a recognition that if the industries were to implement any updates to their facilities and improve their facilities, it would take, it wouldn't be until at least a year out because right now they're pretty much gearing up for their processing season and then they can't do any upgrades to their facilities. So it would start in November at the earliest. So is it fair to say that this compliance step is like the biggest hindrance then to making everything else kind of flow, so to speak? Is that accurate? I don't think so. I think that compliance step is one of the, the major steps. It's, um, it's, I think it will be beneficial to get that, that new review um, in writing so that we can all see industries are, are very interested in seeing that as well. Um, but then the next step would be the buy-in from the industries and their commitment on how much they're willing to reduce their loads and flows to the treatment plant, and that will adjust what the design look like looks like. And it's not scrapping of the 90% documents. It's an adjustment of those documents. That's why we didn't take it to 100%. Um, there's plenty of changes that can be made within the 90%. Um, and there's a lot of work that wouldn't need to be redone within the documents that have been prepared already. Um, and so the, these I think, changes, not to interrupt you, but mm -hmm. would these changes be more focused on our needs, right, versus like wants? Right. It is, okay. Yeah. Thank you. But there, uh, so there's the needs, which uh -huh. is the, the NOV CDO uh, addressing that. And then there's the, okay, we're going to address these needs. We still need to get a new permit. What does that new permit look like? And so then I guess that becomes a need. Um, but it's not really that what will be in, listed in that compliance letter, but it will become a need as the new permit is developed. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, so is it fair to say that that 40 million, 40 million number is obviously a want, right? It is. It's um, more of a long-term number, and mm -hmm. and there is a proposed phasing plan out there. Um, I think that with the compliance review letter, it will help to check on how that um, how that phasing can be done because you're you're always going to need upgrades to the plants the facilities you improve them and then they're going to degrade you know so there should in general be this long-term capital improvement plan or funding to know that you're going to need to replace equipment you're going to need to replace structures um, so it's not necessarily the 40 million amount, it's the timing of the money, uh, when that money needs to be spent that's more critical, I think, to, to also consider. 
Um, Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm confused now. I've been listening to the perception of the other other council members, and I thought I had a grasp on like the order of operations here. Can can you explain to me very simply, like to like to a five year old, right? <laughs> what are the what are the next steps in order in this mm -hmm. process? Next steps: uh, compliance review letter. Okay, compliance review letter. An estimated time for that again? Uh, a month. Okay, one month. Okay, Nick, that's step one. Compliance letter. Okay. Discussion with industries. So commitment from industries. Okay, commitment. And right after the compliance letter is received, that, that negotiation will, will resume or, or it's, it's already escalate. in progress. I don't think it's really st been stopped. It's, it's the hard part is okay. setting a timeline. Like a compliance for letter will help solidify the overall design and kind of understand what we have us. to do. Yeah, help us. Right, get to what the near term, what the near term need is. Okay, that's step two, commitment from the industry. And, and we uh, revise the design based on that commitment. If, if needed, revise the design. Okay. And then work with the permitting unit to finalize the permit, the new permit. Okay. And then at that point, we would just be waiting for approval of the permit, and that's the process that could take up to a year? Um, no, it's the development process that can take up to a year. Okay, so step four would have been the permitting unit with an estimated timeline for that being months, weeks? Um, months. Months, okay. And then, then what? We got the permitting unit, and then where do we go? And then you've, uh, well, there's funding. Now we know what we got to do. We got to figure out how to pay for it. Funding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Potentially several months there, staff, right? Seeking funding, potentially. I think, yeah, my experience with the CWSRF program, for example, is a year from when a completed application is submitted. Okay, for funding. Okay, so now we got funding. Now funding to now the year. Now you construct. Uh, construction. And construction on that? It depends on how... Or? what that final construction project looks like. Just at 2B, the one that we're looking at, do you recall? If that was 2B, then I would say it's, um, let's say, five-year project. Years. Okay. Okay. And then construction and then finalization of that construction project. Does permitting or compliance come back in again and f perform another process that nope. takes time? So five, six, seven, like 20, 30. 2031, if everything went according to this timeline? Yeah, okay. They, that, that really helped me because I got really confused on what the, what the process was. Thank you. Allison, hearing you speak, I'm, I'm starting to realize the five of us, our frustration is very little to do with you and with Justin. Our frustration is with our industry partners and Earlier tonight, we heard uh, where one of our other local industries is really working together with the community to improve life within the city of Escalon. And while we appreciate them being at the table, I would like to make a suggestion. If we get that commitment from them, we actually invite them to come to a city council meeting and talk to us because it's really important to see that. Uh, you, you spoke for the council there when you said our frustration is a commitment from the industry. That's, that's not my frustration. Okay. That's my frustration. I'm just speaking for myself. Any other questions here before you open it up to the public here? Let's go ahead and open it up to the public then and come on up to the podium if you have questions, concerns, comments. Yeah, I only got five minutes, so I'm, I'm just going to scrape the top. Do we still have a permit? And do we still have a notice of violation to come into compliance with? We, have, we haven't met the conditions for the violation? I, I thought you originally said in the presentation that you'd submitted all the information to the state uh, for that violation and they'd accepted it. Can we go back to the original slides here? But the final piece was the April 2nd visit and now the final review. Let's go to the notice of violation. 
cease and desist order of 2014, <coughs> the, let's see, wastewater discharge. Okay, the required submission of reports, you said you, could, you sent those in? And were they accepted? Are there any outstanding issues that would leave us in violation? All right, well, <laughs> that's 10 years ago, 10 years ago. 2019, we had a plan for the wastewater treatment plant for $16 million. Um, I don't know where that went awry and, and why we didn't go ahead and do that. Um, and, and now we have to spend $40 million. That just seems outrageous to me or more. What has been submitted to the state? Did that $40 million plan get submitted to the state? Your presentation that you put on here is what you submitted to the state? No. I'm confused. What? The report of the discharge is essentially I don't know. Uh, the violation was because of the industries. It wasn't because of domestic discharge. Anything associated with that violation ought to be paid for by the industries. Don't care where you're position is on uh, whether they're a benefit to the city or not. They don't pay us any income taxes. We, we get nothing from them. We owe them nothing. If they did pick up and move uh, Mr. Mayor, you know, we'll rezone the land and make some money off it. <clears throat> I think you go ahead with the industries under the conditions that have been proposed because we haven't seen anything else. You have every comment that they make to the industries and vice versa needs to be documented. Those things, and same thing with, uh, with SSJID. All this stuff is just hearsay. We're, we're hearing a lot of stuff, but nothing's in writing. So everything from this, stamp, uh, this point forward, if it's already done in writing, fine. If not, you need to see it. All of these presentations there have a list of all of these conversations and have them reduced in mem to, uh, and memorized into uh, memoranda. The, Budget for the project. We got $1.4 million uh, for this project here. What are the, where, where, where's the costing of that? That should be here every, every three months. It's in their contract. The contract signed by the city, and Frank can tell you this, uh, says there'll be a presentation, a detailed presentation every quarter, every three months, with all the financials of all, of, all the costs and the budgets. So we haven't gotten that from the beginning. Um, the cost of the wastewater treatment plant annually was brought up. That's, <laughs> that was in the last wastewater treatment uh, the fee study. And the staff here should know what that costs off the top of their heads. You know, what does it cost to run that plant? Should have got your answer right there, right tonight. I don't know why they don't have it. Well, look, look it up. No, go ahead and look it up. But these are kind of things that are basic questions. These are, these are no brainers. <laughs> Would be available. Uh, uh, speaking of documentation uh, with the state, all of these conversations they said they've had, again, documentation so you can actually see what they've been talking about and, and the responses. And uh, again, I go back to $16.3 million. That was a modernization study. Um, for the plant, it was going to take care of everything, you know, for the next 80 to 100 years, and that got thrown away. And we went back to, you know, maintenance uh, of the of the plant at three times that. I, I I can't wrap my head around that. If it's that expensive, maybe we should have all of the treatment done at the industries. They say they don't have the land for it, but you know, it, that was part of that study in 2019 what they needed to do to reduce their load on our treatment plant, and nobody's done anything in five years. So again, you know, let's document this thing. Let's get these people on board. They, they need to sign up now. We, we could have had that permit held off that they're gonna get uh, here in June and reduce all, you know, made stricter requirements, charge more money, done all kinds of things, but we haven't done anything. All right, time. 
Anybody else would like to come up and speak on the wastewater treatment plant presentation? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council. Um, at this time, it's 8.40. We're going to take a five-minute bathroom break and come back in about five, maybe six minutes. We'll be right back. Thank you.
I got one, thank you. Chief, administrative costs, right? I mean, if you needed to clean all the clean up the cash flow. Were you in my neighborhood this morning? Was somebody in our neighborhood this morning? Over there by Greg, you guys good? Yeah. You guys good? No, but I can get it. All right, everybody. Thank you for allowing the bathroom break. Greatly appreciated. We're going to get back at the agenda here. Uh, next up is our consent calendar. These items are considered routine in nature and are acted upon by a single action unless requested by an individual council member or member of the public for special consideration. Is there anything at the council level that we need to pull for consideration or discussion? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to pull items 8 and 10 as well as abstain from number 1. Okay, was there anything in the public that is on the consent calendar that somebody would like to pull for further discussion or consideration? All right, seeing none, uh, we'll look for a motion on the balance to start with. I'll move to approve the consent calendar as amended. All right. All those, in, or excuse me, do we have a second on that motion? I second that. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries 5 0. So we're looking for a discussion on item 8 and 10. Council Member Strumman. Yeah, so number 8, um, we're back to the same point that we were at with the downtown improvement project or the park improvement project where you're asking us to award a, a contract for. Six hundred and fifty eight thousand dollars, but I don't think any of us know about the project quite honestly um, and it, It's hard for me to I mean My I put my full faith in staff, but if somebody were to come up and ask questions about the Valdepena waterway water line improvement I I, I can't speak to that and so That's my concern Have any response to that staff? Um, I can't speak <clears throat> to prior to my time, of course. Um, I did believe, I thought, that um, staff had shared this um, project. Uh, we certainly shared the Irwin project. These projects are similar. We, at the same time of replacing old line, line that um, is an old technology, it's breaking down, we get continual um, water leaks and we are repairing it constantly. We are coupling water line replacements with street improvements. So overlaying um, the street to improve the condition of the pavement. We have done several of these in the last... I, I can say I recall seeing this in the list of next project up and there's Four to six of them at one point in time. We've been slowly knocking off top ones, yeah. priority ones. I know that. Out of the budget, Dave, is that where you saw that? It was in the budget, and it's yeah. been in a CIP um, in both, construction yeah. line yeah. items in there in the last several budgets that I've recall seeing Val to be yeah, mentioned. I remember it in the budget. And yeah. just to answer in short, it's it's aging water line and aging roadway. Okay. My, and Justin and, and Jalen. Obviously, we have the utmost faith in you. My request, though, moving forward, if we're awarding contracts, please just come before council before we award the contract and do a short little presentation so that if somebody asks, tell me about this project, we, we can speak to it. So your request would be to take it off of consent in the future and have a short presentation on it before we move to approve it, is what you're asking for? No, what I'm asking is that if we go out before we go out to bid just do a short presentation to council so that we're aware of the project 
so that if a member of the community comes and says, hey, I, I'm a local contractor, I noticed the city has this bid for this water line, what do you know about it? At least we can speak to it as opposed to being a single line item in the budget. That's all I'm asking. Is that a presentation you want to counsel? Is that information you would like one-on-one -on -one with counsel, like emailed? I think it's important to share with the council. You could do it in your staff communications. I think that's certainly a fair comment. I, I think we can provide uh, information on projects uh, prior to award. And your concern with item 10? Um, what are we, what are we surplusing? There's not a list or it's in the, it's in the report. A couple of old Did round six. So oh, yeah. So it's a uh, page two of the staff report. I'm sorry. I apologies. So it's a 2005 crown Victoria and a 2011 crown Victoria. We're going to assume they've flipped over that at Elmer multiple times and it's been beat up pretty hard. Uh, the 2005, <laughs> yes, it is completely unusable. The 2011, as far as the vehicle goes, it's, we're going to spend money to keep it running, but the biggest problem is the electrical. Uh, we're going to have to get it completely rewired if we're going to continue oh, using right. it as a patrol vehicle, and that would just be <laughs> throwing good money after bad. So, that. Chief, just for the public's information, and for my own information, so when we are surplusing patrol vehicles, briefly, what's the process look like? Uh, in the past, they went to public auction. I think they generally use Maloney's. Uh, we've found out about a new uh, site called Public Surplus. We're going to attempt to sell them online, and we won't have to worry about transporting them there. We'll, the auction will be completely online, and then buyer comes to the PD to pick them up. That's all I had. So with that, I'll make a motion to approve items 8 and 10 of the consent calendar. We have a second on that motion. I'll second. Um, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Uh, next up, item 11, staff communications. Who's up first tonight? Uh, I'll turn it over to Chief Hargraves if you have anything for an update. Uh, just the staff report uh, you may have noticed that I don't know where we at. A slightly different format. Uh, I took out some redundant issues or redundant uh, data and then added a couple extra. Uh, most notably would be traffic stops. Uh, there was just pre in previous reports there was just a line for officer initiated activity that is all sorts of different things, security checks, uh, uh, public contacts uh, and stuff like that but traffic stops I think are a main thing especially with the city kind of uh, being interested in what are we doing as far as traffic control just goes out to show that we are out there and we are making stops and then uh, also with the traffic citations uh, the citation data is a little bit flawed you see 126 citations thinking that's 126 traffic violations it's not all traffic violations a lot of those are misdemeanor arrests that are also included in the citations so i broke that up and then uh, just as far as the uh, crimes go uh, in 2022 they switched over from ucr uh, uniform crime reporting to uh, national incident based reporting system nibers and uh, it just changed it to kind of get away from the UCR because it's outdated and not used. I have to say the new format, I like it. Oh, thank you. I really do. Thank you, Chief. Uh, one brief uh, update. Just wanted to let Council know, I'm sure you've noticed, but the two orchards have been completely removed um, and completely grounded, grounded down. Um, there are still some wood piles left in the orchard that to be removed, but uh, uh, the process now well, we're kind of come up with a plan on how to maintain that because we do know now that the weeds will start occurring um, and things like that. So I'm getting a game plan on keeping that at bay until we decide what we want to do to it or what we can do with it. That'll be it. And then no further comments from the city manager's office. All right. If there's no other questions on uh, staff communications, next up is going to be matters presented from the audience. Uh, the public may address the city council on any item that is on the agenda at the time the item is called. The public may also address the City Council on any item not on the agenda that is within the subject matter of the City of Escalon. 
Each speaker is limited to a maximum of five minutes. Unused time may not be yielded to another speaker. You may state your name and address for the record. However, it is not required. Due to state law, action will not be taken on any item that is not on the agenda and except for brief responses, the council is prohibited from discussing any item not on the agenda. If it requires action, it will be referred to staff and or placed on a future agenda. The determination of whether an item is within the subject matter of the city is a discretionary decision made by the mayor. And with that, we're gonna open it up to chambers if anybody would like to come to the podium and speak. Good evening, Council Mayor. Just a couple of things I wanna run by you guys and give you some food for thought. Um, our park, downtown park, I thought maybe we could go to the railroad, and I don't know if it's feasible or not, but offer them a trade. Some land we own there up the, on, of, uh, off of St. John, we have that 7.2 acres. I was thinking maybe we could split three off of way, work with the county, and see if they'd let us trade the three acres for the downtown, and then they could have a spur out there, which would help them with the three acres, it would help us too, because now we'd have a way to get stuff in and out of the town on a railroad. Something to look into. Instead of sitting there and putting more money into a park we don't own, um, I talked to some people tonight about drilling those ponds we have in the park and putting the water in the ground, but I guess it's illegal to do a, a uh, dry well in these towns, but I think there's exceptions. I remember talking to a farmer that got the exception from the county, so it just seems a shame that we pump all this water in these ponds out to the river instead of trying to recycle it some way, because there's thousands of gallons that go out every year when we have major rains. The orchards, how are we doing on the orchards? Uh, we get, we've cleared the orchards. Thank God, finally. Uh, hopefully we got a plan for them now that we've done that. Um, I think that's, oh, well, congratulations on your promotion there, uh, Dylan. I hope you uh, are successful. You too. Yeah, I think <laughs> you'll be fine. And overall, I think you guys had a great night with those questions for the water. I think uh, you guys are on, right on the money on this thing. Get that information straight before you sign up for anything. We're gonna have to do something, we don't know what, but at least we'll, if we would have redo, as long as we have all that information, at least we can say we knew what we knew instead of we didn't know. And you haven't been given good information, enough of it at least. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to come up to the podium tonight? Anybody on the GoTo meeting at this point tonight? I see no hands raised. All right, then we're going to go ahead and close matters presented from the audience at this point and move on to item 12, public hearing. Introduce and waive first reading and consider ordinance number XXX, establishing a planned development zone district PD3 for the development of an 18 unit senior living community. Uh, staff. Thank you, Mayor. As was read, this is a public hearing. This is a rezone. Um, so that requires an ordinance. Um, this is the first reading. It would require a second reading and then um, the zoning would take effect thereafter. So a little bit of background. Um, there was an application um, to staff we have reviewed. It then went to planning commission for their recommendation onto the city council, but also approval of site and architecture. Um, the planning commission in March did approve site and architecture on a 5-0 vote. Now, the item before you is the plan development, the rezone, essentially. This property is zoned commercial, C2 property. Um, you will recognize it as a portion of the McDonald's property. So there was a larger parcel. Um, McDonald's took a portion of it. This remainder still zoned R2, uh, C2, excuse me, community commercial. The applicant who is with us tonight uh, is planning, has proposed an 18 unit senior living community. So single story, 18 unit um, senior living homes, um, apartments. Uh, one will be for an on-site manager and the other 17 will be for tenants who are seniors. Um, the CEQA for this project has been determined to be exempt under section 15332, infill development project. As I mentioned, site and architecture has been approved by the planning commission. Um, you will recall in this project some months ago, the city council in September 
did approve a fee deferral and reduction agreement. Um, there was an original request to defer some of the utility fees. Um, those are for use fees and therefore can't be deferred or else others in the system are subsidizing that deferral. So there was a request for a reduction of the park related fees that was approved about a 50% reduction from about 12,000 per unit to 6,000 per unit. As part of the agreement, the applicant as um, applicable under state law will seek to um, house those that are 62 years and older and either live or work within the city of Escalon, again, as um, appropriate by state law. Further, the applicant will set the current, the proposed rate for lease rent um, and hold that for a period of two years, no increases. Uh, it's currently estimated to be 1,600 and then increase it approximately half of what could be increased over the next five years after the two year period. And so that um, was approved by the council in September. The overall project will be deed restricted to those 55 years and older except perhaps the on-site manager um, with, again, the preference to those 62 years and older. So in your packet, um, there are a number of exhibits that show the site and architecture that is uh, not necessarily the purview um, for the council tonight, um, but is provided by reference, uh, for your reference, excuse me. Um, purview of the council tonight is the rezone moving from a commercial use um, this property is off McHenry it is on country wood to a residential use for the senior um, apartment complexes the project is also um, must uh, must comply with the city's affordable housing um, ordinance the, um, basically an inclusionary housing ordinance, which requires 10 to 15% of the total units be affordable. Um, so that equates to two units in this case. Those will be um, a sub subsidized units through county vouchers. Um, that's how the applicant will com comply with that <coughs> requirement. So with that, um, staff would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, in that large packet that we had to look at, there were a lot of different agencies that had uh, input, shall we say. Um, based on the staff's review at this point, did the applicant meet pretty much all they requested? If there were any changes or concerns, are we good to go with all the other agencies that looked at this project? <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, we are good with all the other agencies as well as all um, the city's requirements in terms of site and architecture. Um, so everything has been complied with and approved by, by the planning commission awesome. as such. Okay. Any other questions here at the? Yeah, um, yeah, I've got one. It looks like Caltrans took a look at it. Uh, it's been expressed to me some concerns about uh, traffic in that area due to McDonald's and the 18 additional units. Um, I noticed in the letter from Caltrans that doesn't really talk anything about traffic. Is that, is that a separate study? Was that done at the same time? Were, were there concerns? Um, so this is not off the state highway. So Caltrans did not necessarily look that closely in terms of um, impact to their system. We did have the applicant prepare a traffic analysis. The traffic analysis piggybacked on what uh, McDonald's had done, and the traffic analysis showed really negligible um, increase to traffic in that area. Is that now, essentially because the address is on Countrywood as opposed to McHenry? If that was, if the address had been McHenry, would that be a different scenario? No, McHenry in that area is not a, it's not a state highway either. Um, south of Patterson, it is a state highway 108. Um, now I recognize from a technical, <coughs> excuse me, standpoint, um, 
a traffic analysis can say it's a neg negligible impact. Um, residents may have a difference of opinion on that, and, and we heard certainly a lot of concerns expressed um, during the McDonald's approval. Um, you know, we have all seen how that has played out now over the last several months, and you know, I haven't spoken specifically with uh, residential neighbors um, there, although one on, on Deborah, and um, things seem to be going okay. I, I won't make a qualitative statement there. Um, but the traffic analysis did show it would be negligible. So after, after completion of the project, it, for the residents, their avenue would be our traffic calming plan if, if the local residents or in that neighborhood found there to be an issue with traffic or anybody else trying to access that neighborhood, that would be their avenue to express concerns and, and look for a remedy. Thank you. And just of note, there were no comments um, from the public uh, at the Planning Commission meeting. So Jalen, I just have one quick question. Um, if this type of project is allowable in the C2 zone, why are we required to change the zoning from a C2 to a PD? It is allowable with a plan development, and a plan development is essentially a rezone. So it's kind of this circular issue. Okay, so if the plan develop, so you have to put the plan development in in order to qualify under the C2, is that what you said? It is essentially like a conditionally permitted use. The condition in this case is the development of a plan development, which is a rezone. Got the questions up here at the council? If not, is there any questions up here at the or out there in the uh, audience tonight regarding this process tonight? We talked about the traffic problem, and there's, you're saying there is no study done to show whether or not there is going to be a problem. There was a traffic analysis done. You're telling us through the analysis they didn't identify any kind of an impact from the 18 homes there. Correct. There is not an impact that would um, unduly burden the streets or the residents in that area. I find hard to believe, but okay. So basically, after it all goes down, we're stuck, we, we buy the like I said, the, the developer. The next question is, how much money are we deferring for this development? Are we deferring any for the uh, fees and stuff? Yes. Um, so there was a reduction of 50% of the parks fee, and then the fees we're essentially <coughs> deferred. Um, the applicant will pay, instead of all of it at building permit, we'll pay it over a five-year period. So you will pay all the fees over a five-year period? We'll pay all the fees except for the 50% reduction in the park uh, impact fee. What does that come to in dollars? It is approximately $6,000 times 18, which, who's the math with? 108000 We ever done this before? We waive those fees. Good question. Yeah, I don't think we ever have. I was 28 years of it. I don't think I ever did. Uh, the next question is, um, you know, we're doing building, which is probably good. We need some units, but what about water? You know, we're talking about all these water issues we're having. We're going to build more homes. How does that play into that? Certainly, any new development, even at this size, 18 units, will have some impact on water. This is a relatively minor impact on an infill development site. Um, you know, relatively low amount of water being pulled from an, so from an 18 unit. It's designed to be minimal landscaping and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What about the night lighting? Is it going to affect the neighbors? Um, not as proposed. That is something else that the Planning Commission um, considered and was not deemed to be, yeah, not deemed to be an issue. Anybody else in the audience are on the go-to meeting that would like to speak to this topic? No hands raised on go-to. We'll go ahead and close public comment. Do we have any questions? I was just going to ask, do we have any questions for the applicant who is in the building? <laughs> I have uh, one request, and that 
It's for uh, on the conditions of approval number six to be removed, um, which has to do with the um, the potential of a CFD being created and being a requirement of this project. Sorry, I didn't. You might have to get a little closer to the mic. I didn't catch all of that. I apologize. Uh, the condition of approval number six, which is a community facility feed district issue where saying if a CFD is created that it would be a requirement of the project I would like and, to and I can just read it for the record so condition number six as was stated by the applicant community facilities yeah. district colon the city of Escalon is evaluating the use of community facilities districts these are enhanced LLD BADs essentially um, should the city council adopt a policy or ordinance which authorizes to proceed with the formation of CFDs, this will become a requirement of the project. Um, that is, if prior to construction is how we have conditioned the project. Certainly at... Um, oh, when we had looked at the CFDs, that the, the stipulation was that they, they had already began... Um, application process not not beginning of construction so there were uh, ample questions about the community uh, facilities district and that de no determination was made by the council at that time um, staff is uh, preparing more information to bring it back to council I don't think a determination was made but I think it was a specific request by myself and mm -hmm. I, I thought that we had consensus on that but I'd be happy to go back and take a look in essence, staff was asked to, to bring back various options, and, and you're absolutely right. That was one of them. Jalen, if we go through this process and um, this gets approved and Mr. Sales does the rezone, and then two, three months later, you, we get the CFD process going, isn't that sort of a gotcha after... He's already anticipated his budget amounts back to what council member Engel said. Isn't that like, sorry, we already passed it. I mean, I, I, uh, I don't really necessarily have a warm fuzzy about applying this condition. Yeah, I think um, a couple different things. Uh, council. So this is the one second. This is the condition. Yeah, so would they have discretion? Okay. We look, um, so, we're looking at what the Planning Commission approved, or? I'm looking at uh, Exhibit F, Conditions of Approval. That's, but that's per the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission already approved this. So. He's asking for an exemption. I would agree with removing six. Well, okay, so, and, and Frank is looking at that. I'll, I'll try to speak loud, not into a microphone. The way this condition is written gives the council maximum flexibility to do what they want to do. <coughs> um, if a CFD were to be adopted, you know, sort of a citywide program, Council could absolutely say at that time, no projects that have approved applications, no projects that are submitted um, in the application process, or, excuse me, yes, every single one. So um, if the council were to approve of CFD sometime before construction started, um, you could condition those CFDs to not include those projects that already have approval. That's not how this condition reads. I think it would say this may become a requirement of the project if that was the true statement. So I'm not sure if even I would want that to be. I'd, I'd want six removed altogether at this point. But but if it was that way, it would be this may, may. become. A, okay, I see. I see. Well, right. So since it's approved already, does, does an appeal need to be made? Well, I would just say I don't read. Six is hard and fast than that, but what do I know? Um, I would just say the council's, it's, it contemplates once the council adopts a policy ordinance, the policy ordinance itself could 
define its applicability to this project, for example. So it doesn't say that if a CFD is in place for all purposes, it would apply to, it, it could put, in other words, it could put a date where it'd be effective in the new policy and it would set parameters. So I guess my point is, the policy will be become the requirement. The policy will define whether it applies or not. So it's not like the council wouldn't be able to define that later on. Not to confuse the issue, but was this condition in the Weldway <coughs> project that was recently approved by the Planning Commission? Yes. Okay. So then we would have to make that determination about this project and about Weldway you, if if the CFD were to move forward. Or globally, an approach. Okay. Yeah, it's. I was thinking about a policy, and and probably the best way to deal with it is rather than particular projects, just a bright line is when it goes into effect, when it when it goes on comes online, and it would probably capture um, new 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 projects, but a certain not projects that have already had a certain. Or you can distinguish between certain types of industrial projects versus residential. I think the discussion also the last time was perhaps limited to just residential. So, I mean, the policy would be crafted to deal with uh, its applicability for any new projects. We talk about when the project starts construction. For example. So, is that at the point when the applicant gets a permit that's considered construction we would at that point? We would define that policy. We would define that policy. I think if you're doing it when the start of construction, you're already too late. And they need to be made aware of this once they've submitted for a building permit. Construction is way too late. Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is the council can, when it, if it were to get, adopt a CFD policy or program, it would define when it goes into effect under the rate of method of apportionment in that when you do your resolution of attention, you're going to essentially state when these things are going to come online and when they will apply. Um, I'm not saying that's not the notice that you provide the potential projects. I'm just saying those would be built into the actual policy that's adopted. Soon if, if this gets rezoned tonight, one way or another on item six, just irrespective of that, when would you pull permits and start, do you think? Six months-ish. Yeah, it makes it hard for me to make budget and financial decisions without knowing what this is out, you know, how who knows what this fee could be, and especially when I've already agreed to cap limits on what I can raise rents and things like that, it makes it. I can appreciate the intent of staff and f trying to determine the applicability of a CFD in these projects, but the developers are developing their budgets and we can't come back after the fact and just say, oh, sorry. Now, now you have to submit an additional $50,000 because we decided to incorporate a CFD. I just think it's bad optics. So I, I would like to make a motion to... Um, Before we make a motion, we do have to ask... Oh, wait, we already gone through public comment. No, never mind. We did go through public comment. My apologies. Okay. So, Frank, do we make a motion on this or... Oh, I need to close it again. It's just the first reading. Public hearing. <coughs> they have the applicant. We closed the public hearing. We did. We closed public comment and brought up the applicant before we were ready to move forward. So, yeah, the, the motions for the rezone um, to introduce then waive the, the first reading is set forth on item 12. So that, that would be the motion. Um, so we don't have power to like amend this at this moment, is what he's saying, right? I mean, all we're doing is rezoning. It has of, to be on the, the agenda to of be approval, able to do that. The conditions of approval were baked in to the approvals at the planning commission level. It would require an appeal. So I think. Um, one solution should the council um, choose is if you choose again to to move forward with this item while it's part of the motion giving direction to staff um, either specifically on this project or you know some blanket um, line to not implement CFDs should they be approved 
considering these projects. So a motion specifically on the rezone as stated in the, um, the staff report and direction to staff to, to not implement the CFD on this project or otherwise. So, so in other words, you would, you would adopt it as presented. You wouldn't change the conditions of approval because technically you can't, but you don't have to change the approval to, at the same time to give staff direction to not implement the CFD as to this project. This is the right for the city to do it. It's not the obligation for the city to do it. And so what you're saying is do not, you can direct staff not to implement the CFD it, to work for, I mean, the CFD would come back to this council anyways, or a future council anyway, so be your decision. But basically what you can say is with the direction that no CFD will be implemented on this project. Okay. So I'm going to make a motion to um, approve the... Um, Introduce. Introduce the f and waive the first reading of the PD3 um, for the development of an 18-unit senior living community um, and uh, remove the condition uh, for the applicability of a CFD for this project. And instead of remove the condition, not implement the condition. Okay. Not implement the condition, not remove it. <clears throat> I'll second that. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries 5-0. All right. Uh, administrative matters item 13, authorize the city manager to execute a professional service agreement with our Dura uh, staff. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, so this, as was read again, is a professional services agreement we do not, the city does not have the staffing resources to have an engineering department or an engineer on staff. And so the city, like with some other services, contracts out for these services. So all the design work, um, all the review of building permits, of encroachment permits, um, anything that an engineer would do, we do have a consultant do that. <clears throat> As I understand, in 2014, the city did have a city engineer on staff. That staff member provided two weeks notice and departed. The city, um, back then, in a scramble, were looking at various options. Um, they did come across a consultant who could come on board quickly and Essentially, the city has had a contract with the same entity. It was Gianni and Cole first. Um, Ardura since bought Gianni, Gianni and Cole. Um, and so we've had a contract with them for these now 10 years. Um, as we staff likes to do, and, and based on some comments from the council, we wanted to send out this contract to an RFP to see who else was out there, to see what current rates were, um, just to see you know, if, if there was uh, anything that would be in the better interest of, of the city. After the RFP process, the city review, received two proposals, one from the, in, the incumbent, Ardura, and then one other from SNG, basically out of Tracy area. After a review of the proposals, um, it was relatively clear in the scoring done by staff that Ardura was um, the more qualified and the less expensive option. Um, we based it, let me just grab it from the staff report. Um, one second. coming out to me immediately. But we based it on familiarity with the city, knowledge of um, the projects, cost, and overall ability to do the work that the city is, is requesting. 
And so uh, Ardura is staff's recommendation <coughs> at this point. Um, we are recommending a five-year um, term with uh, potential for three-year options. We went with a longer term here, which of course is at the discretion of the council because these projects, as we've heard today, the projects that the engineering group works on are longer term. And unlike even with the building um, side, which we'll hear in item 14 next, is familiarity with the projects with the city is key in engineering, more so even than building permits, um, inspection and, and plan review, which is sort of boilerplated you know, across any jurisdiction. And so that is um, staff's recommendation. Be happy to answer any questions that the council has on this item. Thank you. Questions here at the council level on this item? Yes. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to thank um, the council for considering my request from the last meeting to postpone these, meeting, these two items to today's meeting. Um, appreciate that. Um, so, as stated earlier, and for the Ardura team in the audience, please don't think I'm picking on you. Um, but I, um, while I can appreciate staff's comment about <clears throat> engineering takes a long time, I would recommend um, that we modify the terms um, for these projects so that they're in alignment between the city engineer and the building review. So typically the way that I'm used to seeing professional services agreements is that a contract is written for, um, at least with the state of California, for three years with two one-year options to follow. Um, that forces consultants to actually make sure that they're doing the work um, and keeps everybody accountable. So that, that's my first comment. Second comment, and, and this, is, this is the most important part, is the $75,000 per year uh, with a duration of, or not to exceed 600,000 for the contract duration <clears throat> That is only for the city engineering services as the city manager. Ardura does a lot of other work for the city. Um, for example, in fiscal year 22-23, um, Ardura, um, the total cost of their bills, including the CIP program, city engineer, and other ancillary services, uh, was paid $510,321.58. Um, so my recommendation, and, and Jalen and I have talked about this, is that the way that their contract is currently structured is when there's a design, they, uh, or when there's a project can, comes up, that they develop tasks, and, and they bill against those particular tasks so what I would like to suggest to the council is that um, they have pots of money that are set aside so that it keeps us accountable to them and it keeps them accountable to us so that if city engineering services is approaching $70,000 um, and there are other tasks that are needed to be done, then they can come back to council and say, we're approaching our $75,000 per year. Um, and what that does, it, it's no slight of our Dura, but it, it, it creates some checks and balances um, throughout the, the course of construction so that council members aren't blindsided when they receive a total contract uh, that they were given over a half a million dollars for engineering services in one fiscal year, not 75,000, which is noted here. The other thing just to consider um, is uh, in the world that I live in professionally, if you receive two proposals, um, usually two is not good enough. You'd typically like to have three. Uh, and so if the council so chooses, we could advertise and do a little bit better marketing 
and try to get a third proposal. Um, but it sounds to me like staff has the utmost confidence in Ardura. And so I just wanted to throw that out there, but j just something for the council members to consider. My concern with shortening the term would be that um, that just opens it up to renegotiating contracts for an exceeded amount of that 75, it's multiple years down the road, by locking in at this rate for a longer extended time. I think there's a longer term potential of saving money with the cost of inflation going on right now. I don't see that stopping. You do a term in two years, you renegotiate, all of a sudden 75 becomes 90, and now we're locked into spending more. This, uh, these, this money is not for the current projects, correct? For the big wastewater <coughs> treatment plant, or waste, SSGID, this is strictly for just other professional engineering services? Yeah, it's a standalone question, that is, that is correct. And I'll just pick up on, um, Council Member Stroman's comment. So the 70, I, I wanna make this clear. So if there's different direction by the council, we all are on the same page. The 75,000 is what is billed towards the general fund. There are tasks as was referenced to the tune of you know 500,000 in, in the year referenced that are the project related. So they are not paid for out of the general fund, they are from the projects. So the wastewater treatment plant, you know, Val de Pena, all the projects that we do, if there's a funding source, any design work that they do, coordination, that is on top of the 75. So the 75,000 again is review of building permits, review of applications, development applications that come in. Anytime we do something like a traffic calming program and engineering is looking at it, um, anytime um, we have a, a request to look at a stop sign, you know, those types of things, right? So all of that is, is hit by the general fund. Now, some of that is offset. Encroachment permits, building permits, development applications, a portion of their fees are offset by application fees. So um, if the council so chose, you could say cap it general fund at 75,000 or whatever number you choose and cap all other expenditures at X amount. And then, you know, if we exceeded those X amount in project related or general fund, come back to the council and, and get additional authority to expend more monies. <coughs> Jalen, one question. Their hourly rate sheet that's part of this agenda item? Yes. Is that locked in for the total duration of five years or for eight years? Um, Back to the mayor's mm, point. No. <laughs> Let me just look. Yes. Well, I think they do have the discretion. This is, um, let me just pull up something real quick, try to find it. I think they do have the um, discretion to not change the hourly rate, but increase by, you know, ENR, right? Incre increase by. Um, the index that and I can tell you in reviewing this the co form of contract hint hint legal legal hint um, there's no language in here whatsoever regarding um, adjusting their rates for CPI so if we award this contract they're locked into these hourly rates for the next eight years you'll actually see Jalen, I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, Please, thank on, you. On, on the header of the, uh, the fee schedule, it shows that there is a uh, subject to review of consumer price index escalation or 3%, whichever is greater. Where do you see that? <coughs> it's, oh, it's page, on page 386. 387, 386. I, I see it on the bottom of 388, actually. As well. It's up here. It's it's all, yeah. Okay. We zoom in a bit. The the most clearest one's about a 388 where it says 
unless specified otherwise, all billing rates are subject to annual review for CPI escalation of 3%, whichever is greater. Which, to your point, Mr. Mayor, the, the rates will fluctuate based off of CPI. Yeah, and again, though, if you're locking in at the base rates that we have now, and you're only getting 3%, and somebody else comes back two years later, they start off at 90, and they still get their 3%. I'm still thinking that long-term, it would be better than shortening the length of this contract myself. Any firm is going to increase CPI and or escalation of some sort. I don't think anybody's not going to try and do that on a contract. It's just a matter of right now, we've got this locked in at the lowest rate possible. It will go higher than just a 3% escalation in three years probably, is my thought. Any other questions down here? I am concerned. I mean, maybe three years <clears throat> with two one-year alternates is a little tight, but to award a contract, an eight-year contract on something like this seems a little much. As an option, who has the option to opt out? Do we both parties have to agree to extend? We can adopt at five if we so chose. It's not, an, it's not a requirement. They may want to extend and we go, you know, it's just not working for us. We can not option to extend, correct? Okay. What was the previous contract? How, what was the term length on that? <laughs> it did not have a term length. It did not have a term length. So it could be either one of us can end it at any time before this before this time. And it wasn't a cap of seventy five thousand per year. There was none of that. Um, there appeared to be a cap. It was a very low number, um, which was exceeded many, many, many years ago. Based off of all my questions, I will say that I, I appreciate staff's effort to actually put some formality to this contract because it actually protects both parties. So thank you for, for making the effort to do this. So how many years have we been using Ordura for our engineering services? Ten. Ten, okay. This is our tenth year. Started in 2014. Okay. Is there anybody in the public here in the audience that would like to speak on this topic? You mean on go to still? I don't think there's anybody out there at this point. One other, one other, <coughs> one other consultant on for the next item. All right. No well, worries. that being said, then I'll bring it back to council here for potential action. What are we looking to do tonight? I, I, I would agree with you, Dave. I think, um, you know, if keeping it where it's at, locking them in is probably the wisest thing, given the potential for significant inflation. So your motion is to accept the contract as stated and move to approve? Oh, yeah, correct. Sorry. Um, didn't realize I was making a motion. <laughs> it sounded like you were. That's why I was like, sorry. are you making a motion? Yeah, that was, <laughs> it sounded like one. <laughs> sorry about that. I'd, I'd like to make a motion to um, basically do exactly what you have written down here. So I can read the whole thing if you like. No, we're good. We have a motion to approve. Motion the, to approve staff's recommendation as I'll presented. I'll second. Okay. So we have a motion to approve staff's recommendation and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Nay. Motion carries 4-1. All right. Thank you, staff. Moving on to item 14, authorize the city manager to <coughs> execute a professional service agreement with CSG consultants for two years with options. Staff. All right. One second here. Very similar staff report, different service. Um, we did have um, more recently gone out to RFP have um, proceeded with this firm. But like with, um, like with Ardura, um, this, well, unlike with Ardura, this contract was expiring, actually expired at the end of March. Um, so we went out to, to RFP. We did receive four proposals. <coughs> Excuse me. Let the cough drop kick in. Um, we reviewed those proposals uh, very diligently. Ultimately, CSG, the incumbent um, consultant, with a mix of service provided and cost was the overall winner. 
we have been happy with CSG overall. Um, there were some very good proposals that came in and um, they were worth consideration, frankly. CSG um, has done a good job, I would say, in keeping costs down for the city. Um, most of these services work with you know, hired consultants. We do not need a full or half day always. Um, one provision in, in the CSG contract is they will bill us for the amount of hours that they actually work. Um, and the cost of that versus a guaranteed half a day or a guaranteed day is considerable. Additionally, um, most of the other proposers had a higher level staff member that they were proposing, which also increased the costs. Um, so a lot of it came down to cost. Um, and we are talking the difference between $30,000, $40,000 per year and $70,000 per year. So it was not a nominal cost. It was a significant cost. Um, again, have, have been over the years, I, I, we have used um, CSG for a great number of years, have been pleased with the service that has, has been provided. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Council level questions tonight on this item. Yeah, so now I'm gonna think, you guys are gonna think I'm a little wackadoo, but um, if it seems to me like council is, um, really likes the long-term rate, um, would you consider matching these extending this contract instead of just uh, two years, extending it for five years with a one-year option. I mean, if, if we're trying to lock us, lock consultants in and be fiscally responsible, why not extend this contract if we're happy with it? And at the point of the RFP, was it specifically asked for this type of a term, or was that something that the that uh, CSG came and said, "This is what we're looking to do for a contract"? <laughs> was this driven by the by the vendor? No. At this point, or just the term was staff's recommendation in both cases. Um, Frank just brought up a good point. If there was a change to the term, which CSG has seen, um, and they are online, I think it'd be a good idea, as Frank mentioned, to just get their confirmation. And similarly to the last comment, again, Jalen and staff, thank you for formally issuing the RFP and getting uh, this process down into something that's accountable <coughs> to both parties. What are your thoughts, uh, who's on the line with CSG as far as uh, terms of service with this contract, is that something you would consider as far as uh, looking to possibly making this a longer contract? Is that something that's in your wheelhouse of being able to make a decision on that? What are your thoughts? Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. Um, this is Cricket Brinkman, who is your project manager. And I po we apologize for not being there in person tonight. We were traveling and it's very dark, so I can't turn on the camera but yes um i am in a position if you are willing to extend the services of the contract to a longer term yes we would be more than happy to do that thank you any other comments or questions or concerns at the council level no, not for me how about out there in the audience what are our thoughts here back? Looks like nobody's here in the audience looking to talk as far as extending the contract time periods. What are we thinking moving that two years to the five years and then have in the three one year extensions available to us? I was thinking more like five years with uh, two one year extensions. Any thoughts about that? Um, I think given the history with them and knowing that they've done good work, I don't see an issue with giving a longer you know, contract time. Okay. Is that something that might be uh, workable for you, uh, Cricket? 
Yes, that sounds fantastic. Thank you for the vote of confidence. We much appreciate it. Right. Sounds like everybody's generally in agreement on that. You have some thoughts on that? Mr. Yeah, Engel? just a question for legal. If we're changing the, the terms that we put out, as staff chose the terms for the RFP, do we need to put that back out for RFP? Generally, for professional services contract, the city has more flexibility than for public works projects. For under the public contract code, those cannot be changed once you open the bids. There are four more rules. RFPs, they, they, they're qualifications based and they part of the process is sort of a negotiation, so we're just continuing that process right now. There's, n there's not a legal obligation? No. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to um, execute a prof to authorize the city manager to execute a professional services agreement with CSG consultants for a period of five years with two one-year option extension with the option of two one-year extensions for building safety inspection, fire prevention, and plan check services. We have a motion. Do we have a second for that? I'll second that. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you for hanging in there with us, Cricket. I know it's been a long night. We appreciate your efforts on that. Thanks. And that's okay. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. You too. Uh, moving on. Uh, Last item, Council Communications, future agenda items. Uh, starting off tonight, uh, Mr. Stroman, what do you got for us tonight? I think I've talked enough tonight, um, but I just really would like to thank um, the public for showing up, sharing their thoughts, sharing their opinions. Um, thank you to Escalon Strong and Escalon uh, Small Animal Clinic and Hogan Manufacturing for your hard work at the um, supporting the rec program and um, kind of on a more somber note um, as most people are aware we've had two very significant uh, auto accidents within the last week actually three um, one closed to the city Saturday night uh, one last week and then another one in Manteca Saturday night uh, resulted in uh, nine deaths and so just reminding the community to be extra vigilant, drive defensive, people are driving like idiots, and um, just takes two minutes to slow down. And so obviously I think um, I can speak for myself, really care about people, and I'd hate for an Escalon resident to end up as a fatality. Um, that being said, I sure have seen a lot more uh, police officers on McHenry in the last few days. So, Chief, thank you for that. Um, and Justin, thanks for everything. Welcome on board. Um, and, last but, and last but certainly not least, um, I would just like to make a public comment um, regarding Jalen. Um, your communication with the council over the last two weeks has been impeccable and I really appreciate you making an effort to keep council members informed in all that you do. That's all I have. Oh. Councilman Walker. Well, I'll take on the second of that. I do really, if you guys, I mean, you guys wouldn't know, but the communication has increased so much in the last month. I really do appreciate all the briefings that we've been given, and I do feel a lot more informed and better doing my job up here. So I really do appreciate that and the work from staff um, in the past month and going forward. So um, thank you for that. And then... Um, I just want to say you know, we, we had some discussion about the CFD issue um, with the senior housing. I just want to say that I don't think that any CFDs uh, should be implemented for projects currently in the planning or have been approved in this process as those companies are going to need to have budgeting, um, go through a budgeting process and, and have that expectation as they're going through. It's going to help us develop business here without having some undue uh, burdens on them or unexpected burdens. So I just want to say that out loud. Um, and then um, on the traffic thing, we should expect some more traffic. Um, if people don't know, Riverbank is developing a big 
planned uh, community right on the other side of the river. Um, let's see, on Patterson off of Coffee. So just know that with that large development and a little bit, a little more push of um, homes towards Escalon, we're gonna see more traffic coming from the McHenry area there. Um, and so just be very vigilant and know that we're making decisions like <coughs> whether or not to expand McHenry into four is a huge decision because that would impact our traffic a lot more than we're actually thinking that it will once that development goes in. So um, just be very vigilant, know uh, where our communities are that are coming into Escalon and how much room we have between cities and what you can do um, to keep Escalon small. Um, and then we've also discussed, uh, thank you for the uh, presentation today, it's fantastic. Um, both of those projects are big projects coming in. With the, I, I do want to continue working with partners on both of those, and so, and that was a, a statement made was working with our partners, and so with uh, Ardura and SSJID for the surface water, I feel like I'm informed with all parties that are here, and I just wanted to that one I'm feeling a lot more confident just because wastewater treatment plant. Um, with our partners with Blackwater, but then our partners also industries. I haven't heard of anything from the industries here since I've been on council. I'm not hearing that we're having meetings, regular meetings of those uh, bi-monthly meetings don't feel regular and it doesn't feel like we're communicating. Um, and so I'm becoming less confident as time moves forward, but I hope that that can be turned around and we can make that more regular and that we can get more information from industry so that they really can be our partners in this moving forward and we can get things done. Um, if you have not seen the community center and Hogan Field, uh, make sure you go out there on a Saturday. Our uh, public works and as well as um, our members of the community have been working out their heart to make our town uh, thrive, uh, our small little Esclon, and it's just gonna take more people um, putting in effort and standing up for themselves to do that. So I appreciate that. And with that, that's uh, all I've got for today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilman Engel. I have no additional uh, communications. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Proctor. Um, I just wanna say a good discussion tonight. Um, it was nice to see the public and staff interact in a in a non-toxic way, in a very productive way. So uh, thanks for the way we're engaging. Uh, you know, um, otherwise, I think, um, you know, welcome to the team, so to speak. Um, and uh, everyone else on staff, I think you're doing a, a good job. You know, just keep working, putting your best foot forward for us. Um, and it looks like you are. So uh, other than that, um, I don't have much to add tonight, so. Thank you, I'll keep it brief and echo that as well. Staff, you're doing a great job, keep it up. We appreciate all your efforts for sure. Um, I'd echo the uh, comment to come out to the Little League ball fields and uh, watch a couple games. Doesn't cost you anything but a little bit of time to come out and say hey and uh, support the kiddos and support some kids even if you don't know them, it's all right to do that as well. It's always enjoyable to watch those kids play. Um, also, I believe we have this week on Wednesday our farmer's market. I believe it's this Wednesday or the next one? I believe it's the 17th. 17th. Is that Wednesday? Yes, sir. It is correct. Wednesday. Okay. So please show your support for the chamber. They're doing an awful lot of work to try and bring something great to our town. So please support that where you can. Might be a little early on some of the veggies. We won't get them all out there, but we'll get some of them. So do what you can to support them so they'll keep on coming back once a month for us. Um, it's been a long meeting. Great discussion on every topic. I appreciate everybody's efforts on that. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and adjourn this meeting. Thank you for all hanging with us. Thanks so much. Thank you.